Hey everybody, good to see you guys. Um, just getting the live cast started um, a little early for everybody. So if you're arriving or if you're watching this at any time later, you know, welcome. If you haven't subscribed, feel free to do that. Make sure to uh, be a part of this uh, YouTube channel if you want to watch a bunch of cool philosophy stuff, learn something maybe. But welcome, everybody. <clears throat> Just me and Kitty for now. <clears throat> but I see a couple of you guys are already in the room or in the uh, live stream, so that's always good. Feel free to say hi. Let me know how you guys are doing. Hopefully everyone's doing really good. <clears throat> Once six o'clock comes, you know, uh, ten minutes around there, we get started on our meeting tonight. Got some good, important notes to cover. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about philosophy of mind, and then once we wrap that topic up, uh, we'll start in on our last subject of the semester, which is life and death and the value of life, and what makes a life go well. So we got some work to accomplish. <clears throat> I figure everybody knows this, but maybe just to make sure I'll send an announcement so that it's not something anybody forgets.
Hello there. How are you guys doing? Got a few moments until we're getting to class time. But good to see you guys. <clears throat> so who's here? Anybody? A couple people? I see a little uh, number is above four, so guess you want uh, shy, you want to say hello? You know, if so, that's always good. Hi, Natalie. Yes, uh, I can see your comment for sure. I don't know um, what was the situation last week. Did you have problems viewing, commenting? Not sure, but I can see you here for sure, and I see your comment. So, <clears throat> good to have you here. <clears throat> you can hear me fine, right? What kind of issues did you have? Anything specific? Or <clears throat> so we just got a few more minutes, then it'll be six. And we'll get get going. <clears throat> You viewed without problems, you just comments weren't going through. Mm. Yeah, I don't know, that's weird. Um, were you watching on a phone or were you watching on a desktop, laptop? Um, I can only speculate what the cause could have been, but uh, I can see your comments, no problem right now, so 
Is there anything different that you're doing this week and that, that you weren't doing last week? Have you changed devices or? I'm not sure, but I'm glad you were able to watch it. And um, <clears throat> now that the comments are working, hopefully that doesn't happen again. <clears throat> I'm happy that we've been relatively uh, glitch-free. I've heard a lot of different weird stories from professor colleagues and the situations they've been going through, you know, with Zoom and everything else, but I feel like we've been managing decently well on a short notice type of basis. <clears throat> So yeah, just another minute and then I'm gonna get us going. Hi, Gilberto. Good to see you. Hope you guys are having a great end to the semester. We just have a couple weeks left. Uh, hopefully, your other classes are going well, and um, you know your families are all health, healthy and happy and safe. Um, so yeah, it's about to be six. So I guess I'll just start us off. Thanks everyone that's here. Um, I see Natalie and Gilberto. Anybody else want to just toss in your comments? Just if you can, that'd be great. So I can see. Um, know who's attending and then that'll give me a sense of like um, you know the familiarity that I have with you guys knowing that names is always good because I you know I, I remember your names and so that helps me but um, please say hello ask questions comment um, at any point the interaction is ideal um, yeah so look it's uh, April 30th Thursday April 30th this is week um, See here, I have in the syllabus pulled right up. This is week uh, 13. Um, so we just have like, you know, a couple of class periods left. The 21st is the last day. That's when we have the uh, final, obviously. The 14th is when your second paper is due, and that's also when the uh, review session was is going to happen. I'm going to send you guys the study guide for the uh, final exam next week. So you'll have about two weeks with the study guide questions. You can then prepare and um, you should be able to, you know, formulate clear responses to the different questions in the study guide. Nowadays, with the um, COVID thing, obviously, it's going to be just how we did it before. Uh, you know, you're taking it at home. You have access to your notes and everything else. And uh, I'm going to send out a sampling of the study guide questions that you'll return to me. But that's on the last day of class. I guess in between now and then, you still have the paper to work on. And um, as we know, there are three different topics on this paper that you can choose from. Uh, one of them is the uh, theory of knowledge, epistemology. One is philosophy of time, and the other one, the other option is uh, philosophy of mind. So today we're going to finish and close out all our notes on philosophy of mind, and then uh, if we can, then we'll start talking about our last subject in the semester after that, which is life and death and uh, the value of human life and what makes a life go well. Oh, hi Sherry, good to see you too. Um, so. You know, if you do have any kind of questions, comments, anything that's not clear, if you want to know anything about the schedule, uh, please let me know at any time. Comment here during the live stream. Send me email or anything else. Hi, Jason. Hi, Shauna. Okay, it's good to see you guys. Great to see you guys tonight. Um, so then, yeah, let's go ahead and resume. We last week were um, starting on a new topic. We finished up the material about the philosophy of mind. So uh, we went over the article by Ted Sider and um, David Lewis. And then we started to talk about this new subject that we're on right now. That's the philosophy of mind. So philosophy of mind, just a little refresher. It's the uh, subject area within philosophy that's uh, focused on consciousness, um, thought, perception, ideas. 
the mental life that you have inside, right? What is going on with that? What is up with consciousness? Is it just the brain? Is it just the physical brain? Or is there something that goes beyond the physical when it comes to consciousness? Uh, is it more like spirit or soul or something like that? So there are different views in the philosophy of mind, um, <clears throat> but the questions are kind of those kind of questions, like what's the ultimate nature of consciousness? Is it something physical? Could it be explained physically or not? Um, could machines ever think? Maybe, maybe not. And then the two, one, two of the big positions that people debate over in the philosophy of mind are monism and dualism. <clears throat> so first of all, monism says that everything in the universe, all of it, is just made out of one type of thing one kind of substance. Dualism is the you know, um, contrary view, which says that no, the universe and all things, they're composed out of two kinds of substance, not one. So you got monists say everything's made out of one thing, there's just one kind of thing. Dualists say there's two kinds. What are these different substances that are being discussed? Okay, so one possibility is physical matter. Physical matter is um, anything that is extended in space meaning that it has mass, it has shape, it has volume, even if it's very small. And the most um, minuscule element of physical matter is generally referred to as the atom. Um, the other substance that we all kind of talked about last week is mind. And uh, the way that the term mind is understood in philosophy is some kind of um, non-physical, immaterial uh, thinking substance. So something that has no extension in space, um, it's not built out of matter. It has no material basis at all. It's just a thinking consciousness that has no material substance. So pure consciousness, not made out of matter. Um, now, monists that I mentioned are those who say that the universe and all things in it are just made out of one kind of substance. Now, depending on which of those two possible substances they think is the only one, you got two types of monism. So on the one hand, you have the people who say everything's just made out of matter, even you and me and our consciousness and our thoughts. Those people are called what? They are called physicalists, okay? Uh, so physicalists say everything's made out of matter. There's nothing that isn't. And it even includes consciousness and perception and thought. That's just made out of the brain, basically, and those are the result of brain states. Um, other than that, the other type of monism is idealism not so uh, popular or I think well regarded today in, in this current day, but it's the idea that everything's just made out of thoughts and there's just no matter at all and everything's just an idea. Um, not necessarily the most widespread view anymore and really we're just kind of focused more on physicalism versus dualism. Now dualism, as we were saying, that's the one which claims that there are both substances. There's matter and there's also the mind. Dualists say um, it's not just one or the other. So physical matter is that which makes up all the objects that take up space, including your body. But the mind is something apart from that, according to dualism. It's this non-physical thing that is just consciousness. Okay, now um, we were trying to build up our understanding of those different views by going through some arguments in favor of uh, either dualism or physicalism. And last week, the only thing we got to cover was Descartes' argument for dualism, um, which is a pretty long and detailed argument. So I'm really just, we're in summary mode right now. I'm like reviewing last week before I add like new material to the board. But, um, and slow me down and ask me to repeat if there's anything else that uh, you hear that you want further clarification or explanation of. But anyway, Descartes' argument for dualism, what is that? Okay, so Rene Descartes was this French philosopher, very well known in the um, you know, Western Academy, and uh, he was born in 1596 and he died in 1650. In 1641, he wrote a book which was called The Meditations, and in the book, his goal was to try and discover what we could know for totally certain. Now, in the sixth meditation of that book, he's prepared to um, affirm the existence of uh, the external world, and the body, but along the way, he makes an argument for dualism. Now, <clears throat> here's how the argument basically goes. It, it starts off by saying that, according to the method of doubt, many things can be doubted and thought to be false. For example, everything that you have ever perceived by the five senses could be false if you were right now in the midst of a big illusion or dream. So we can't say with 100% certainty that the perceptions we have are true, 
neither can we say math and logic is absolutely certain because there could be some deceiver about that, like an evil demon. So in the end, he says, uh, with the method of doubt being applied, the only thing that we can say initially that is totally certain is that you exist as a mind. Uh, because even if your body was a dream and all the things that you sense were just dream images, they, there was, still would be the mind that you have thinking about it. So you know you would exist at least as this thinking thing simply because you have consciousness and thought. So I think therefore I am. From that point on in the argument, he says, well, since you know you exist at least and you have a mind, you know you have ideas in that mind. And one of the ideas in your mind, which he mentions, is very unique and special because it's the idea of God. The idea of God, he says, stands alone because it's the idea of an infinite being. And that's important in his argument because his next step is to say that since you have an idea of an infinite being, God, it has to come from an infinite source. And nothing else could have generated that idea. Certainly nothing finite could have generated an infinite idea. That's his point. So God, therefore, really has to exist. The only possible explanation for the cause of the idea you have of him. So then there's the proof of God existing. And since he's thought of as perfectly good, he's not a deceiver. And what it means that he's not a deceiver, among other things, is that he would not let you get clear and distinct perceptions wrong. So if you have a clear and distinct perception, it has to be true. Now, we have many different clear and distinct perceptions, but one that he mentions, which is needed for his dualist conclusion, is that if you can imagine and clearly conceive of two things existing separately from each other, then those two things actually can be separated and therefore they are not identical to each other. Um, and so he says, of course, based on the method of doubt, you can clearly conceive of or imagine your mind existing without the body. Since you can imagine yourself to exist as a thinking thing even if you didn't have a body, and that's clearly separable in the mind then that must be the fact that the two things are actually separate in reality. And therefore, the mind and the body are two different, distinct things. It's based on conceivability, everybody. So he's just saying that because you can clearly conceive of that, and because clear and distinct ideas are true, and they must be because God uh, would not want you to be in error about the clear and distinct perceptions, therefore, we can safely um, conclude that the mind and the body are two separate things because they can be clearly understood as separate things. Now, <clears throat> that's where we ran out of time last meeting, I believe, right? And there were just a few more little points that Descartes mentions at the end of his essay. Well, his book, really. In our text, it's kind of converted into an essay almost because it's a short section of the book. But anyway, uh, in his book, Meditations, the sixth meditation that I'm referring to here, he has a couple of additional comments after the proof of dualism or the argument for dualism, right? So I'm going to just put a few of those points here on the board. Um, what he's talking about here are other clear and distinct perceptions. Okay, so other things that are also clear and distinct, aside from just the mind and the body can be separated, other clear and distinct things. Sorry, let me just make sure I uh, silence my phone here. It's vibrating on the table. There are other clear and distinct things, too, which are also guaranteed to be true by the beneficence of God since he's not a deceiver. So what are these other clear and distinct perceptions? So, other clear and distinct perceptions that he mentions next. So again, this is still all from the Descartes. We are just trying to, um, finalize the notes that we have on Descartes, and then we'll move ahead in the order that you see listed in the syllabus. But anyway, okay, so what are some other clear and distinct perceptions? Well, here's another one that he mentions. Um, the external world exists. The external world exists. Hey, Cameron, good to see you there. Awesome. Um, now, he's now claiming that this is clear and distinct. Remember that at the beginning of the meditations, he really definitively said, who knows if the external world's real? Maybe it's just a big dream that you're having, so who knows if that outside environment that you're in is a real environment or just a simulation or a dream state. But now he's coming back to the sixth meditation, and he's taking this big, long circle uh, back to common sense, 
Why is he allowing himself to uh, assume that these things are true at this point? Because now he believes he has actually established that God exists. And having that little bit of extra leverage allows him to say, well, when things are very clear, since I can prove that God exists, uh, those things got to be true. And these are one of the things that seems to be true. But he gives a couple of reasons why it's clear and distinct. Okay, so he says this is clear and distinct, and he gives like three of these reasons. Okay, so you know this is a this is kind of a you know odd question, right? But nothing I can do about that. It's, that's the nature of philosophy. So. Um, you, you think the external world exists, right? Like, I mean, you've read Descartes now, or you, at least you've heard me talk about him, I guess. Um, but I'm sure that you've never really seriously thought, you know, what is a reason that you could give me, which makes it seem, you know, very, very clear that that is a real environment outside of your mind there. What makes it seem like it's not just you making it up, like you mentally creating everything? Why does it seem like it's actually got its own independent existence? And it's not just the result of you, your subjectivity. What makes the world seem like it's objectively real? Can you tell me? What's the reason? Is there a reason? I mean, there are, there are some reasons, but I'm just trying to see what you might be able to offer up from your own judgment or recollections of the Descartes material, but anything. I'll just take whatever you give me. So. The world, you know, you're sitting here looking at a computer. What makes you think it's actually out there outside of your head? I mean, because when you're dreaming, you think that the world around you and the dream is real. So how come you think that this environment you're in right now is not a dream? Like, what makes you think that it's not just a mental construct? Nothing? I mean, you got to have something. Just tell me why. <clears throat> what could be a good reason to say that? I mean, because it seems pretty clear, right? And we're going to assume that it is, but why? Why is it so clear? I've got 11 really bright people here. It only takes one to answer my question. So just let me know. I mean, you don't have to have like a right answer. You just have to have something that you think. Okay, Natalie, you say other individuals make the world seem real. Okay, fair enough. But the thing is... How come you don't know that those other people are just dreams? Like, I mean, you're not them. So how come you don't know that you're not the one that's just dreaming them up? That's the question I'm asking. Okay, Sherry. You say, because I'm able to experience it, even if it's through the senses. Mm, no, because, you, I mean, you have experiences of dreams that, that, that are not real at all. Like, definite, like, when you have dreams, like, later tonight, that's not going to be a real scenario. And you're going to be experiencing that. Gilberto, you say, because there are mistakes that God wouldn't possibly make because he's omnibenevolent. Uh, I'm not sure if I can understand your statement, Gilberto, because the question I'm asking is a little different. I'm asking, how do you know that the external world exists? What are these mistakes that you're talking about? I mean, I, I guess you're saying because if I was wrong about that, God would be massively deceiving the true. But I'm still trying to get on to the point of why it's clear. Natalie, you say this, physical touch makes the world seem real. Um, oh, no, don't worry, Michael. Good to see you. I'm glad you showed up, and now that you're here, happy to have you. Um, so we're kind of dancing around it a little bit. Um, okay, I'm going to sort of help you out a little bit. I'll meet you halfway, okay, and see if you can meet me in the middle and come up with what I'm trying to help you with. So if this world was a dream, and you're the dreamer of that dream, okay, so you're the only real thing, and all these other people and everything around you, they're just figments of your imagination, okay? Yeah, Sherry, we're clear to you. I mean, but Descartes is just a human being, so it's, it's not really a different difference too much. But anyway, um, suppose this world that you're in is not just a dream that you're having. If it was a dream, though, right, and you're the creator of the dream, uh, what kind of experiences do you think you would have? You know, if, if this world that you are in was not even externally real and it was actually just a big mental thing, then what kind of experiences do you think that you would cause yourself to have if you, after all, were creating reality? If, if your mind creates reality, then what kind of experiences do you think you'd have? Just a question there. 
And this will help us to see why this is supposed to be clear and distinct. <clears throat> what is that? Why? Good dreams? Okay, Shauna, that's very good. Um, if you're having this experience of your life, but it's just an illusion and it's just a dream, then wouldn't you think that you'd have the power to control the dream and just make it be whatever you want it? So you would have, I would think, as you say, Shauna, yes, just good experiences, only favorable ones, right? So if this world was a dream and you're just making it up as you go along, then where do you think you would find your uh, keys if you lost them? Okay, so Sherry, there you go. You're kind of making my point. Um, you'd be doing whatever amazing things that you could possibly imagine. And so if you do have lucid dreams, and I've had that a few times, right? So it's like you realize something about this experience just doesn't seem real. And then you're like, wow, it's actually not real. So good, Shauna, you're saying in your pocket. Good, why would that be the place you'd find them? Because it's a very convenient place to find them so you don't have to look very far. In fact, would you ever lose them in the first place? Probably not. And it doesn't end there, right? If this world was a dream, <clears throat> Um, you'd never experience loss, probably. You know, you never go through all the hardships. You'd probably have a massive amount of wealth. Um, not saying that you don't, but like everything would be fully laid out in a perfect scenario for you if the dream you're having was a dream. So that's one point he says. I cannot perceive only the things that are favorable. Okay, <clears throat> and that's also true, Natalie. Right? You'd think if this world's a dream, then you know you'd be the the central focal point of of the dream, right? So everyone would know you. Um, you'd be like one of the most well-known people. I mean, I wonder if it's like weird being like a president or something and thinking maybe I am dreaming because it seems like that. But anyways, we, for better or worse, maybe for better or not. So so this is clear and distinct. One re reason that we've now kind of discussed is because I cannot perceive only with that which is favorable. So that's kind of got like two sides to it, right? If this was a dream and you're the sort of author of it, then not only would you only have positive experiences, but you would never have negative ones. So like if you saw something bad that was happening to you, you could just think it out of existence, right? And sometimes people talk about like, you know, the power of the mind and I can manifest things by hoping and wishing that they happen, but really it's not necessarily so. Otherwise, uh, you could definitely make yourself in a better situation than what you're in probably right now. So that's one thing. It makes it seem that the external world is independent of you, right? Because if it was not, then it would be able to be responsive to your will. But the world outside of you just is what it is, it seems, regardless of what you want it to be like or whatever. So I don't think we'd be probably going through a pandemic and stuff if we had the mental ability to just shape the world to our will because it's not actually real in and of itself. Not saying that you don't have the power to affect the world or change it and stuff. You know, even though it's actually real, but you can't just, let's say, manifest something like on this table. And that's another thing. So kind of in the same line of thinking, you cannot um, control what you perceive. I cannot control what I perceive. Okay, so I cannot perceive only that which is favorable. And I also cannot control what I'm perceiving either in a more general sense. Okay, so the second point here is just the idea that if this world was a dream, then you could probably just manifest things in your environment by wanting them to be there. Like right now, let me tell you this, okay? I want you to look to your right, wherever you're at, and I want you to just perceive an alligator right there. Can you do that? No, you can't do it. I know you can't do it. What you can do is like remember the memories you have of alligators and stuff, and you can put that in your mind's eye. But you can't like make one appear as though it's on your floor, like actual perception. Now, if this was a dream, though, you might be able to do that. Sherry, you say you have lucid dreams, so lucid dream challenge. Tonight, whenever you have a dream next time, make an alligator pop up. And then you'll know you're in a dream, right? But right now you can't do it, see? So if this was a dream and you weren't in the real world, you'd think that you could just make things happen and make things manifest, and that's not necessarily when it's definitely not possible, right? I'm trying really hard to like just make a... Poodle appear right here. It's just not happening, you see? So that gives us a sense that the external world is actually independent. It's not just controlled by the mind. It's got its own reality. It exists without your mind. Okay, and then a third thing, and this is a, one of the most interesting, I think, philosophical reasons that this is clear this thing. He says, furthermore, um, memories are less vivid than the original perceptions, okay? 
Memories are less vivid than original perceptions. Okay, it says memories are less vivid than original perception. Um, so think about this, right? What you're experiencing right now watching this lecture is not a memory, at least not yet, because it's happening live, it's happening now in the moment. But think about last week's lecture. That is just now in your memory, because it's over with. Um, now what's clearer and sharper to you? Thinking in your mind's eye of like, forget even last week, let's go back further. Remember when we were actually at Orange Coast College over there in the social science building or whatever? Um, take that memory. <clears throat> How clear is it when you're thinking about the memory? Is it as clear as this, like this experience of actually seeing and hearing me speak to you in the moment? I don't think so, right? So memories, and uh, the further you get from the moment that they happen, <clears throat> they get more and more vague, vid like washed out, faded. Um, when the experience is happening live, it's very sharp and detailed, right? Like this. But do you think that this experience that we're having in the present is going to be just as clear when you try to recall it next week? No, no, no. So what experience, what accounts then for the difference in the vividness of the two experiences? The present experience versus the memory of it that you try to recall or recollect later. What could possibly explain that? Well, the only thing that seems to really make that clear and reasonable is that the external world exists because think about it why should it be so clear when you initially have the experience well that's because at that time you are in the presence of the external objects that you're perceiving and so they're making an impression on your sense organs like you know the object in the room the the, the students the professor the the desks there's like light reflecting off of them bouncing into your eyes you're touching the objects with your body you know, you're hearing the voice and so forth in the environment that you're actually in. And so your sense organs are being stimulated by the objects that are outside of them. When you try to remember those things later, you're no longer in the presence of the objects, right? So if you're trying to remember how it was back when we were in class on day one, you're no longer in the class. You're no longer surrounded by all the different students. So now you just have to try and draw or reframe the image from the, uh, the traces that have been imparted into your memory. But if the world was just a dream and there was no external environment out there, then there would not be a difference between the level of clarity of an initial experience and a later memorial recall of it because they would both be mental. The initial experience would not be you being in the presence of actual objects. It would just be you having dreams. And then when you try to like, quote unquote, remember the original experience, it'd be just another mental phantasm. So there shouldn't be any reason for that thing to drop off in clarity except if we accept the idea that when you initially had the experience, you're actually presented with objects outside of you that you perceived in the moment. And then later when you're trying to recall those things, you're not able to do it as clearly because you're not with the objects anymore. You know, so like trying to remember a song on the radio in your mind is not the same as just hearing it because when you hear it, the sound waves are hitting your ears from the outside environment, right? But if the whole world was a dream, then there wouldn't be sound waves from an outside environment. There would just be you, the dreamer. So you would think that the level of detail and accuracy of a remembered experience would just be exactly identical to the original, but it's not. So can you can comprehend what I am saying? The third reason here or basis to assume and think now that it's somewhat proven that the external world really does exist. So for anybody that you know was really tripping on Descartes and thinking all these thoughts about, man, maybe this whole environment I'm in is just a simulation or some type of weird dream or hologram. Now you can see that at the tail end of his book, he really does return back to our everyday um, you know, preconceived notions, but he doesn't just say it's obvious and who would, death, who would think otherwise. He tries to supply us with some basic reasons. These are reasons that it's very clear, that no one would doubt it. And God is the being according to him that makes sure that clear things aren't false. Okay, so there's one other um, clear and distinct perception that is added on. So not just that the external world exists, but also this point, that, um, that I have a body, 
or you know, I'm I'm saying that in the first person, but of course, spoken by you, you have a body. So <clears throat> I know that um, of course you believe you have a body, right? Look, it's right there. Uh, but we're gonna just you know try to give some reasons why it seems obvious. So try to think about it, right, for just a second. What makes you think it's very obvious that you have a body that is your body? What makes you think that that body that's in your particular seat right now is yours, specifically that it's possessed by you? What makes you think that you have that body? And, you know, can you think of a reason why? Why is it something that you would say is yours? Can you think of a reason for that? It's pretty clear, isn't it? But why? Why though? <clears throat> okay, good. So Sherry, you're definitely coming up with some of the proper reasons that he mentions. You talk about that you can control it. Okay, good. Uh, and Gilberto, same. Good, also good. That Because you can move it when you think to move it. And Natalie, you say because it's been mine as long as I can remember, but uh, it's kind of begging the question, though, because, I mean, we don't know if it's yours until you tell me why it's clear. You, know, you, can, you can't just say, well, it's mine because it's mine. But, um, but these other comments, yes. So, for example, um, if I want my body to do something, I can just command my body to do that. So right now, I'm going to snap my fingers. Okay? And um, I could make that happen by just thinking it. I'm like... Let's snap the finger. I mean, you don't have to really articulate words in my head. It's just something that I make my hands do. But I cannot control the movements of any other individual's body. I could tell somebody, hey, can you snap your fingers? But it's not the same as like directly having control over my own body and causing the action from the inside. So that's a good reason, right, of course, to think that it is your body because you have the ability to control it with your mind but not other bodies. And so that means that it seems to be – you know, uniquely in your possession, okay? Like, no matter how hard I try, I can't just command the movements of your body, but I can command the movements of mine, of course. Even me speaking right now is an obvious case of that. So, um, I have a body, and this is clear and distinct for a couple reasons. This is, I'm just going to abbreviate clear and distinct because, okay, number one, I can control the... Uh, this body, the movement of this body, but not others. Okay. Now, the second little reason, which is given for it being clear and distinct, is um, I think it's kind of related to your other half of your uh, last comment, Sherry, where you say you can feel that it's there. Um, Feelings. So if I pinch my hand, hand right now, right, like, ah, it hurts a little bit. It's like I feel a small amount of pain. But if you get pinched, I don't feel pain. I might, I might like feel bad for you. Be like, man, that sucks that that person got a little bit of a pinch going on. But I'm not the one who feels it directly, you see. So I only experience sensations when a stimulus is applied to my body, okay? but not to others. So if I'm eating a delicious ice cream cone, I'm tasting it and I'm experiencing the taste. If you're watching me from a third person perspective eat the ice cream cone, you're not tasting it. You're looking at another person tasting it. So um, a secondary reason to just have it very clear that you have a body is because when things happen with and to the body of yours, you are the one who experiences those things, but not when things happen to other people's bodies. Another person, God forbid, you know, set on fire and you're burning. It's very painful, I'm sure, for them. But you're not the one who's experiencing it because it's not happening to your body. Now, if this was not your body and it was just something, I don't know, that you're riding along in or whatever, like a captain on a ship, you know, if a cannonball hits the ship, the captain doesn't go, ouch, because it's not a part of him, right? But because you experience sensations when whatever stimulus is given to your physical body, it seems that it's closely joined to you in a way that it's not to anybody else. So second reason, um, I experience sensations when this body is given a stimuli but not others.
Okay, what it says here, if you cannot read it, is that reason number two that this is clear, because I experience sensations when this body is given a stimuli, but not when others are. And then there's a third reason, um, which I'm just going to put here because I have less space at the bottom now, but the third reason would be, this is pretty easy, because, because I cannot remove myself from this body. But I can, of course, separate myself from any other body. So I cannot uh, remove myself from this body, unlike others. Okay, so um, take, for example, me and this watch that I'm wearing. We're two different physical objects. Right now, it's, we're joined together because it's on my wrist, but we don't have to be. I mean, if I really want to, I could take this watch off, and I could go 100 million miles away from it, right? I, maybe not a million, but you get the point. I don't have to be close by to it. We can go to our different ways. And that's the same with any other object besides my own body, right? If I don't want to be in this apartment, I mean, we're on lockdown, right? So I guess I shouldn't go too far from it. But uh, physically speaking, it's not that it's physically impossible to do that. Uh, talk about social distancing, right? So you're being told right now, distance yourself physically from the other people. But one person who you can't distance yourself from is who? You, okay? You can't get away from that body. And that, again would indicate that it's yours because you're riding around in it the whole time and you can't go anywhere else uh, away from it. Now, you might hear that and think, isn't that a little weird though? Because Descartes earlier was arguing that the mind and body can be separated. Yes, yes, and he does say that, but he doesn't mean separated while you're still alive, like separated at death when the soul escapes the body. But for the time period anyway that you're living this mortal existence, uh, the mind and the body are mingled together, but the mind, he says, is more essentially what you are because you can imagine existing as that mind even if the body no longer exists or if it never existed in the first place. So you know you're thinking. That can't be challenged because, look, you are thinking. But whether you actually have a physical body, that was something that was at least capable of being doubted, so that's why he gave us our argument for dualism. Nonetheless, though, he said God is too perfectly good to allow clear and distinct things to turn out to be false. So now we actually can reestablish confidence in certain things that were shaken for a minute by the method of doubt. Initially, the method of doubt would have caused you to think, maybe I'm dreaming, who knows? Maybe I don't even have a body. Maybe this body is just an illusion. But now at the tail end of his book, he says, actually, never mind what I said on the first two chapters. We were trying to pursue the method of doubt, but now that we know that God exists by means of this proof that he gives or this argument that he gives, we can say it's, uh, we can trust and believe in the clear and distinct perceptions. One of them is that the mind and the body are ultimately separate. But furthermore, we know that there's an external world because of the reasons I mentioned before, and also that you have a body, at least temporarily so, uh, for the reasons that are mentioned here. Okay, so that's really about it for Descartes. You know, he's a very detailed and nuanced author. There's more to be said. There's always more to be said about him. But um, that's pretty much what I thought was the most essential information to present to you guys on it. Let me go back to the book one time and just summarize or cap this off with a little quotation from him. <clears throat> so at the end of the meditation six, and this is just the end of his you know, book, he says, um, <clears throat> I'm just finding the relevant quote. Okay. Uh, accordingly, I should not have any further fears about the falsity of what my senses tell me every day. On the contrary, the exaggerated doubts of the last few days should be dismissed as laughable. This applies especially to the principal reason for doubt, namely my inability to distinguish between being asleep and being awake. Because I now notice that there is a vast difference between the two, in that dreams are never linked by memory with all the other actions of life as waking experiences are. Could have presented that as another one of the reasons, because your dreams are episodic, but your life has a continuity to it. So dreams don't just pick up where the last dream left off. That's another reason to think that this is the real situation you're in, and when you dream at night, that's just an illusion. Um, if while I am awake, 
anyone were suddenly to appear to me and then disappear immediately, as happens when I'm sleeping, so that I could not see where he had gone from or come from, it would not be unreasonable for me to judge that he was a ghost or a vision created by my brain rather than a real person. But when I distinctly see where things come from and where and when they come to me, and when I can connect my perceptions of them with the whole of the rest of my life without a break, then I am quite certain that, I, that when I encounter these things, I am not asleep but awake, and I ought not to have even the slightest doubt of their reality if after calling upon all the senses as well as my memory and my intellect in order to check them, I receive no conflicting reports from any of those sources. Because from the fact that God is not a deceiver, it follows that in cases like these, I am completely free from error. Um, but since the pressure of things to be done does not always allow us to stop and make such a meticulous check, it must be admitted that in this human life, we are often liable to make mistakes about particular things, and we just must acknowledge the weakness of our nature. So that's his last uh, closing words of the meditations. You've heard now from Descartes why he believes dualism is true. It's because it's clear and distinct that you can conceive of the separation of the mind and the body. And um, since he's using the idea that God is perfectly good and not a deceiver, that opens up and unlocks a few other things that were temporarily set to the side by the method of doubt. Like, for the example, uh, that you're not dreaming and the external world is actually objectively real and that you have a body and that your sensations generally resemble the things that uh, exist in the out outside world which give you those perceptions. Because God's not a deceiver, basically. He doesn't want you to get these basic things wrong, like that I have a body, that the external world is real. But it's interesting, right? Because if you didn't, according to Descartes, if you didn't uh, have the ability to prove that God existed, then you would never actually have the certainty that he thinks God's existence can supply. So in his view, anyway, the, the knowledge that God exists is key to avoiding skepticism because it, uh, absent the knowledge that God exists, everything remains doubtful because there's nothing to sort of guarantee that clear and distinct perceptions would be true. I don't know if I would agree with that necessary element of his philosophy, but it's, you know, it's a reasonable and well-argued um, author in position. So, done with Descartes, and now we're going to continue through these philosophers of mind. We've got to hear the other side of the argument now. So we've talked about dualism, and we've got to get to that balance. So the other side of this whole debate is physicalism. And let's just try to jump right into it. So I'm going to erase this. And uh, the first author that we're going to talk about having to do with physicalism is a current day living philosopher who's um, you know, still out there writing and teaching. His name is Daniel Stoljar. Daniel Stoljar uh, was born in 1967. He's an Australian. And... Uh, you know, he's a professor of philosophy over there, and this is something that he wrote in uh, 2005. It's been um, titled in our textbook with a very simple, straightforward title, just Physicalism. So, Daniel Stoljar, 2005, Physicalism. Physicalism by Stoljar. So um, he's going to try and clarify and defend the physicalist position, the position of the monist who says that everything in the universe is made out of matter. There's no mind. There's no such thing as a non-physical substance that's conscious. There's just the brain, really. And everything is just made out of matter. Everything's made out of atoms. Me and you, our consciousness, no exception to that. It's all just made out of matter. Um, so he wants to, first of all, try and just claim will tell us what the term physicalism means as he understands it, and then to kind of expand on it so that we have a better grasp about it. So here's his quick definition of physicalism. He puts it simply, it's just the statement, everything is physical. Everything is physical. Okay, so what he, you know, the, the word, what it means is that all things are physical. And that's a pretty, you know, sweeping general claim because it's not saying some things are physical. It's not saying, you know, most things are physical. It's, it's going further than that. It's saying 100% of everything is physical. There is no thing that is not physical. There is not one thing that's not physical. Everything is. So are you. And even the thoughts and the feelings and the experiences that you're having mentally, that's still physical too. Um, so it's a claim about what everything in the universe is made out of. You know, if you went way back in history, 
in the ancient Greek world, pre-Socratic philosophers that lived 2,500 years ago. Some of them were uh, interested in the question of what makes this universe and what composes everything. And there were people that had all kinds of strange ideas. There was this man whose name was Thales, and he even lived before Socrates. Thales believed everything was made out of water. Um, why would he think that? Well, I mean, you know, you've got to remember, this is not exactly the modern era where we had all these different tools to observe things and understand their molecular composition. But he had some basic reasons. He thought, okay, well, if you breathe on your hand, like water collects. So maybe like air is just a transmuted form of water. And then we constantly need to drink water. We sweat, you know. Um, so maybe the world and everything in it are just various states and of, of water in various forms. You know, you can see that it turns into a solid. Sometimes it's a gas, a vapor. Sometimes it's a liquid. So he thought, oh, everything's made out of water. And that's kind of, of course, today a silly idea, you know, with a benefit of hindsight. Um, but physicalism is the modern view that says everything's made out of one thing, except we're not talking about water, of course. We're just talking about physical atoms of, of matter. So it says everything in this universe is made out of matter. Everything's made out of physical stuff. Um, one way that he puts it, which I thought was kind of interesting, is he says, the claim of physicalism, you can understand it if you look at it this way, that though there are other subjects that people study, you know, other disciplines that, that don't seem like they have anything to do with physics, take, for example, history, literature, um, I don't know, uh, philosophy. You know, you might think some of these things don't have anything to do with physics. The philosophy fair actually does kind of have a little bit to do with it because it touches on philosophy of science and physics, but literature or history, let's go with that. Um, say you're studying World War II as a history major. You might think this has nothing to do with physics, but according to physicalism, everything has to do with physics, really, because what is, for example, World War II from the standpoint of physicalism? These are events that play out on the planet Earth's surface, having to do with life forms that exist on that surface, namely humans for the most part. And uh, these life forms are bundles of cells that are made out of matter, which ultimately, in a certain kind of organization, um, come to have conflicts that boil over and lead towards like armed uh, warfare between different nations. But what is all of that? That's just objects operating according to the laws of physics, which are ultimately constituted by matter. And so it's indirectly a branch of physics. What is a poet writing a poem? You might think this has nothing to do with physics. These are the humanities, those are the sciences. But the poem and the poet himself uh, is a physical object. Um, and the exhibition of his poetry and his writing of it is simply the playing out of a physical process with this organism that's just made out of matter. So everything's a branch of physics, according to physicalism, even those things that don't immediately appear to have much to do with it. Because at the end of the day, as one says, everything's just made out of matter. And so everything that occurs in the universe is the playing out of atoms in the void of space, according to the laws of physics. Um, now, he says next, for us to be really detailed in our understanding of physicalism, there are two big questions that we need to kind of pursue and explore. So these two questions, he says, are key to having the real full understanding of physicalism. So I'm going to put them here and then we'll talk about those. Two questions about physicalism. Okay, so first one, the interpretation question. And then the truth question. Okay, so first of all, starting at the top, the interpretation question. <clears throat> this question is, what does it mean to say that everything is physical? So, there it is. What does it mean to say that everything is physical? So 
Okay? So that question is focused completely on just the, the idea, what does this statement mean? How can we interpret the meaning of the claim that everything is physical? The definition of physicalism is that everything is physical, but what does that mean in more depth? How can we interpret and make sense of that statement? All right, so that's one question. And the other one that's different but related is, is it true that everything is physical? That's the truth question. Is it true, though, that everything is physical? Okay, so we see the two questions there on the board. Now, what he says is that there's a sort of logical order here. Because to answer uh, one of these questions, you kind of have to have already tackled the other one first. So what do you think, just based on your intuition, which of these two questions would you have to deal with first before you could even try and answer the other one? You know? One of them has to go first. And only after that can you really try and tackle the other. So which one do you think must be dealt with first in the order of operations here? Interpretation or truth question? Which one's primary at starting us off first? Okay, good, Natalie, yes. The interpretation question is first, and the reason is because you cannot de uh, determine whether a statement is true if you don't even know what it means, right? If I told you um, that you should really be careful when you go back to Orange Coast College because I heard that there's borgles all over campus, you're not going to be able to say, oh, yeah, true or false if you don't even know what the word means. And this is a nonsense word that I just made up for the purpose of just, you know, of, uh, of example, but um, you would not be able to set forth on a search to see whether these things were there or not if you had no interpretation of what this term itself means. So yes, that's right, Natalie. We have to kind of uh, settle the meaning of the statement that everything is physical. And then once we are equipped with the knowledge of what it means, we can make a judgment as to whether it's true or false. So we're going to try and go over this interpretation question first. That's what he says we need to do. And um, to break down the answer to that question, what does it mean to say that everything is physical? The usual uh, method of explaining that is the concept of what is called supervenience. Okay, so this is a key point in the whole discussion of physicalism that we're going to go over now. So I'm going to erase this, and what we're going to do is discuss and explain what is called supervenience. Supervenience is the way that you'll be able to answer this question here, the interpretation question. So, get this clear. Oh, okay. Okay, so supervenience, everybody. Now, that's a word that's kind of like, um, it's a philosophy and science word that is not often used in common speech. In fact, I think it is so, um, you know, particular to the field of academic philosophy and science that it's not even in a lot of uh, standard dictionaries. Like, um, I've noticed that a lot of times it shows up as a spell check error in your word processor. So don't be thrown off by that if that happens. And just to make sure that you can spell it correctly, I'm gonna type it also. Okay. So you see the word there both in the chat and up on the board, supervenience. Okay now, so what is this concept? Once again, we look to the idea or the notion of supervenience to provide an explanation of what it means to say that everything is physical. The, um, the illustration of supervenience that is used is basically the concept of a dot matrix picture. Okay, so dot matrix picture. <clears throat> Let me explain what a dot matrix picture is. Maybe you have a knowledge of that already, or if you don't, I guess I'll make sure that it's clear for you in just a minute. Okay, so um, a dot matrix picture is an image 
which is made out of a bunch of little dots arranged in a particular uh, pattern. Okay, and in fact, this is how uh, a lot of printed materials are made and duplicated. There are old dot matrix printers, for example, and if you look at uh, printed materials like the cover page on a newspaper or a magazine, um, if you look at it under high magnification, that let's say photo on the cover of the headline of the Los Angeles Times or whatever, um, you will therefore see the picture. But if you look at it underneath the magnifying glass, you're going to see under close magnification that there's actually a bunch of tiny little dots that are put together in a particular array. If you back out, you just see the picture formed by the dots. But if you zoom in really close, you just see dots and non-dots along the grid. Okay. Now, how do they, you know, mass produce uh, copies of the same image? It's not magic. What they have is a grid, and along that grid, there is an assignment of dots along each position of the grid. Once the image is converted into this digitized medium that can be stamped onto a newspaper, that photo is displayed on the newspaper by means of stamping it onto the grid, and then the next newspaper slides along in the assembly line process, and an identical dot structure is applied to the new blank canvas, right? So I don't want to confuse you too much. I hope this is clear. A dot matrix picture is what? It's a picture made out of a bunch of little dots, and um, that's all the image is. Well, the word supervenience then is used um, as a verb. The large image supervenes on the dots and the position and placement of the dots. Now, I can offer you a couple of other analogies to the dot matrix example. Daniel Stoljar focuses on the classic uh, case of the dot matrix picture. There are some other things that, are, that will serve just as well in an explanation. So some of you maybe have ever heard of mosaic art. Uh, this is a technique in art where a big picture is formed out of a bunch of tiny little colored tiles that are placed in particular order, right? Now, if you zoom in close and you get very close to the mosaic art, you're just going to see tiles, tiles, tiles of different colors. When you take a step back, then you're going to see uh, the big image formed from the individual tiles of the mosaic, okay? Um, and in that case, the image, whatever it is depicted, supervenes on the placement of tiles. One more example. Okay, just so that we have the, the maximum number of ways to intuit this concept. Right now you're looking at me on a screen, and uh, that's not, you know, a printed page. In fact, I think the example I'm about to give you hits home a little bit better sometimes for, you know, people living now, because a lot of us no longer even view uh, printed images on a, you know, paper, as we might used to have done in the past. So, um, if you zoom in close, to the monitor that you're looking at this on, or the cell phone, or the television screen, whatever. Any of those things, a computer monitor, a, tel uh, a cell phone uh, display, television display, if you look at them very close, what do you think you will see under that high magnification? Now, these are not uh, ink dots, nor are they tiles, but they are little bits, which are called by a certain term. What are those? Anybody know? The little elements which form the basis for a uh, monitor to display a digital image. Your computer screen right now, showing my image, is ultimately composed out of ever so many tiny little, what are they? What, what are those things? The surrogate of the dots of ink for a digital screen. Let me see, what's that? Yes, pixels. Good. Thank you, guys. Exactly. Maria, Gilberto, Sherry, those are pixels, okay? So what is a pixel? One pixel is like a little tricolored panel. And um, how is it that this image is being displayed? Again, it's not magic, okay? So your screen has a certain resolution, which means the maximum number of pixels that it can display on uh, its panel. And for an image to be projected on the screen, the computer has to be given instructions as to how to illuminate each pixel in the grid that forms the back resolution. So if I like take a photo of myself and then I share it on social media or in a group chat or something and everyone's looking at the same picture, it's because you have a device of similar resolution which can map onto its uh, screen the illumination of pixels that 
corresponds to the message delivered and gives you the image that's then reproduced. So just understand then that there can be, and there are many different examples of big structure images or pictures that are made out of a tiny, a bunch of tiny little bit points or parts. One possible way of thinking of it is the dot matrix picture. Another could be the mosaic or the computer image made out of pixels. So a little bit more about this. Let me uh, give you a visual because sometimes that helps to assist in your um, you know, understanding of this. Good kitty. So yes, I'm going to draw a little picture. Hopefully my, how about over here, kitty? Huh? Can I sit right here? Hmm? Take a seat, kitty. Okay. Okay, guys, now um, I'll make sure that she moves in due time once I'm done drawing this, but I'm going to try and create an image here on this panel that we are going to pretend is like a full-blown dot matrix picture. Now, clearly, I have some crude tools to work with, just a marker and my own limited artistic ability, but uh, you know, we just do our best. So here's the image. Really kidding? Okay, I mean, I'll be sad if you say I have no idea what that is, but um, what do you think I'm trying to draw with this little, let's say, dot matrix picture that I put on the board? Let's try and put that on the table. What do you think I'm drawing there? What is that an image of? What's that picture? What is it? I'm gonna break my heart if you say because I just can't tell. Am I that bad at drawing? Maybe I am. That's fair. But okay, good. So you're saying the ocean, the sea. That's nice. Wonderful, beautiful day at the beach or whatever. Um, there have been a couple cases where I don't know. Students have come back and said, "Is it mountains?" I mean, fair enough. It could have looked like that, but I hope that the little birds and such kind of indicated that this is like I don't know an ocean scene. So yeah, you're right. It's it's not the hills. Jason, but it's not so important whether we agree on hills or ocean, but let's just all agree on the ocean case, all right? Now, these are waves. These are some birds. That's the sun. Okay, now I tried to make it uh, pointillistic, right, by just putting a series of little dots instead of just straight lines, you see? Now, um, piece of terminology for us. The term is global feature, okay? <clears throat> Global feature. So this term just refers to a large scale aspect of a dot matrix like this. Or we could just more generally label it a composite structure which has the features of a dot matrix. So a global feature is a big picture, large scale aspect of it. So I'll put that here. Um, a big picture, large scale aspect. feature of the composite. Okay, so just a little bit more elaboration on that. Um, a global feature is not one of the dots, but it is something that is formed by a lot of the dots combined together in an aggregate. So um, in this image here, just let's test your comprehension of the concept. What do you think is a global feature of this composite? As we've defined it, as I've tried to explain it. Again, just so we remember, a global feature is like a big picture element of it. Something that's created by a bunch of the little bits. So what would be one of the global features of this? What do you think? 
Okay, good. The waves, that would be one, for example. Correct. Because the waves are a product of the summation of many dots, right? Individual dots. The ocean would be one. Gilberto, yes. The sun would be another one. The sun shining down over here from that corner of the image. That's something that is uh, composed by the underlying array of dots. The birds, you could say, would be in yet another one. Okay. So now, consi consider this point. If you have two dot matrices not next to each other or in any orientation to each other, but suppose you have two dot matrices and they both had an identical construction in terms of the placement, arrangement, and order of individual dots. Okay, so I'm telling you this. Imagine that we have a dot for dot duplicate over here to the right, right? So in the second dot matrix, wherever there's a dot here, there's a corresponding dot in the other matrix down to the last dot. So if there is a dot for dot duplicate of this other image, of this image, then what would that second image be like if it was a dot for dot duplicate of the first, right? So completely copying the little dot features onto another grid, how would the second image be in comparison to the first if we did that? If we had a second image which was a dot for dot duplicate, how would it appear? It would be, yes, Sherry, it would appear exactly the same, okay? So would it have all the same global features to coin a phrase? Yes. So in the carbon copy of this dot matrix, there would be another C image. It would have the same duplicate birds, sun, and waves. So if there are two matrices, to use the plural, uh, which are identical at the level of the parts that compose it, then they're also going to have exactly identical global features at the macroscopic level. So if they're microscopically identical in terms of the placement of each part, then they're going to be exactly identical at all the larger levels of description too. So they'll have all the same global features in common. If there's another dot matrix, which is a perfect copy of the first in the order and arrangement of each dot. Um, okay, another point. If there's a second dot matrix, which has a different global feature from the first. So imagine that, right? Imagine that there's a second matrix here and it looks like this, except there's only one bird. One of the other birds is missing. If they have different global features, then that means that they also have to have different what? Can you tell me the finish of that sentence? If two, comparing two, dot matrices had different global features, then they must also differ in, in what? Different global features, so they must have different what? So we've got the last point, that if they have the same dot features, they have the same global features. Now I'm asking you from the top down, other direction. Different global features, different dot pattern. Exactly, Gilberto, right. Because, yes, if the dot pattern was the same, then they couldn't have different global features. But if they are different, then they must have had a different dot order. Exactly. Okay, good. So now, um, I want to tell you how this starts to help defend and support the argument for physicalism. Because what we've talked about just here is an analogy to the physical world involving structures built out of either dots or maybe pixels. Um, but this is really just supposed to be a lead-in to a way of thinking about the physical universe that we're a part of. Okay? Now, take us off of the whiteboard and like into our physical space here. This universe could be claimed and is claimed by a physicalist to have a similarity to these matrices. Because the, the idea is that our universe, like the matrices that are being discussed, is a big structure with a whole bunch of big stuff in it and things that are, you know, made out of little parts. But although we have this universe full of objects, it's also built out of a bunch of tiny little pieces. Now, what do you think would be the equivalent of the dots or pixels in the case of actual physical space and physical objects? What would be their ultimate constituent parts. Okay, good, atoms, exactly. So now we're in a position to say how this supervenience concept uh, allows us to interpret the claim that everything is physical. Yes, atoms. Um, the claim that everything is physical basically means this. Everything supervenes on the position of atoms in this universe. So essentially, everything, 
whether it's me or you or my cat or this board or the table, the chair, the Orange Coast College, your car, you know, everything, the Mount Rushmore, uh, Eiffel Tower, you know, objects, events, people, and even thoughts, they're all just the product of a bunch of atoms put together in a particular pattern. So our universe, according to physicalism, is something like a dot matrix. And we are objects that are built out of atoms. Now, global feature, you see the definition. And as applied to this example, you gave me some good, correct um, answers that like the global features here would be like, for example, the, the ocean, the birds, the sun, now transporting us to this universe. What would be, for example, a global feature of the real world, the universe that we're in? What could be, and you have, I guess, infinitely many options. What could be a global feature, for example, of this world? Based on the definition there. Now we're just working with the concept and applying it. So what would be a global feature of this world, for example, for instance? You're saying the table of elements? It's a weird example, though, Sherry, because the table of elements, are you talking about like tiny little... Uh, fundamental um, molecules and particles of the universe, but I'm talking about global features. And we've already said that atoms are the supervenience base of reality. What's a global feature? A global feature is something that is made out of the little atoms. Now, Maria, you're saying a picture of Earth. I mean, I guess, but the universe itself, why are we referring to pictures? I mean, I guess you could say the Mona Lisa. Yeah, it's made out of atoms, but, um, a better example could be given that doesn't confuse us, like a car, a mountain, right? How about a public object, not a category? Can somebody give me one? A specific particular public object that everyone's aware of its existence. Because it's not a problem what you're saying, mountain, car, yeah, that's fine, but that's a category, right? It's not like this or that object. I'm saying iPhone and humans, but we're still with categories. Can you give me a name of somebody or like a, a specific object? I'm asking you, don't just say like pants, but like something, okay, good, Statue of Liberty, there you go. That's one such object, but it's all the things you guys are mentioning, they're all fair examples. I'm just trying to make sure that we're not getting confused into thinking it has to be a type of thing. Okay, good. Eiffel Tower is another good example. The White House, I don't know. Okay, so those are global features. Question, are you a global feature of the universe? According to this definition of the term, are you a global feature? You. That's just a yes or no. Yes, you are. And why? Well, getting right into the weeds of physicalism here, because according to physicalism, you, just as much as anything else around you and everything else around you, you are an object in a physical universe which is fundamentally built out of atoms. And so what you're doing right now, being a human being, is you're existing as a big bundle of atoms that are pieced together like Legos, as it were, to form the object that you are. Okay, and so anything that is the result of many atoms forming together in an aggregate is a global feature of the reality. So objects, events, people, and even thoughts are simply things that supervene on the distribution and order of atoms that make everything in the universe. Okay, so remember I just tried to talk to you guys about comparing two dot matrices side by side, yeah? Let's try and take that same step and think now about the physical universe that way. Now, this is a little bit of a mental gymnastics, right? You got to think outside the box, as they say. Uh, sometimes people have a hard time even thinking inside the box, but I want you to think outside, all right? So um, imagine if you could that there was a second physical universe, okay? I'm not saying there is, but just let's pretend that there was a second universe. I'm not talking about a second planet or a second galaxy. There's already plenty of those in this universe. I mean, an entire separate universe, completely self-contained physical system, closed and different from ours, okay? Well, maybe I shouldn't say different, spoke too soon, because here's what I'm gonna tell you about this other hypothesized secondary universe. Suppose this other universe was exactly an atomic copy of ours, okay? So atom for atom, it's put together the same way as ours is, right? So it's like an atomic duplicate of this universe. Tell me, according to supervenience and physicalism, what should that second universe be like if it was a full physical duplicate of ours to the last atom? What would it be like, this 
this comparison universe? What do you think? What would it be like? Do you understand the uh, question? Yes? It would be the exact same as ours. Right, exactly the same as ours. And why is that true? According to physicalism, it's true because everything is just based on the composition that it has in terms of its atomic composition. So by hypothesis, if there's a second universe that was an atomic copy of ours, it wouldn't just be a physical duplicate. It'd be a duplicate in every possible way. So in that other universe, would there be the coronavirus pandemic happening in the year 2020 on the planet Earth? Yes, because what is that event in our universe? According to physicalism, it's just the outcome of the atoms arranged in space operating according to the physical laws in this part of space time. So would there be a duplicate of you in this universe? And the answer again will be yes. And would this duplicate of you be having the same experiences and thoughts as you? Would it be attending a lecture like this? Yes. Because what you are, according to this view, is nothing other than a constellation of atoms grouped together in a particular very sophisticated um, arrangement, but, but nothing more or less than that. So um, we don't have to assume there is a multiverse. This is just a hypothetical. But the point is that since our universe is an entirely physical place where everything is just made out of matter and everything is just physical, that means that if there was a physical duplicate of the universe, there could not be a psychological, social, or behavioral difference. So what is being denied by this claim is that if there was a physical copy of our universe, for example, there couldn't be another version of you having different thoughts than you're having right now. So your thoughts and experiences mentally are fully controlled and subsumed by the physical basis that underlies them in terms of their atomic composition, ultimately. So with that in place, I'm finally going to be able to just write down Stoljar's um, stated definition of physicalism, um, or at least what supervenience means. So here we go. <clears throat> he puts it like this. <clears throat> okay. So physicalism is true at a possible world W just in case um, any world which is a physical or atomic duplicate of W is a duplicate of W in every respect. Okay, so it looks a little technical to see it there on the board, but I'll try and make it somewhat clear. It just says, if supervenience is true, then this is the essential um, statement that results from that. Physicalism being true means that um, if it's true at our world, if physicalism is true in this universe, and our universe is thus W, that means that any other universe which was exactly an atomic duplicate of ours would also be a duplicate of ours in every way. So historically, socially, psychologically, behaviorally. Would 9-11 still have happened in this duplicate atomic universe? Yes, because all events contained within this physical universe are claimed by physicalists to be the result and the outcome of the particular arrangement of physical atoms that makes it up. So yes, the idea is that right down to the last detail of every event that has ever happened and ever will happen would be perfectly replicated in a second universe if it was an atomic copy of ours. What that appears to mean is that everything is physical because everything supervenes on atoms. Everything supervenes on atoms, meaning that if you have an atomic structure in a closed physical system, which is a perfect reproduction of the atomic facts in the first one, then that second system is going to exhibit all the same global features as the first. So two side-by-side -side dot matrices with the same uh, dot arrangement have to have all the same global features. Two physical universes, for the sake of discussion, with the same atomic level facts would have to have all the same higher level global facts and features as well. 
So now we have the answer to our interpretation question. What does it mean to say that everything is physical? It means that everything supervenes on atoms. So there's nothing to the world and everything in it and me and you and our thoughts uh, aside from their uh, atomic structure. Everything that exists is just a bundle of physical particles operating according to physical laws of nature. And consciousness is nothing different from that. So when you have thoughts, feelings, hopes, dreams, fears, whatever they are, all the mental states you could possibly have, they're just the result of atoms which form the brain and body playing out in space. And um, it's not possible for consciousness to differ from what is governed by the atomic facts of the uh, life form that exhibits consciousness. So there's one interesting uh, presentation of supervenience physicalism. This idea of supervenience is essential to physicalism. So uh, you really have to kind of grasp it, chew on it a little bit, think about it to kind of get what physicalists are saying. When they're saying everything's physical and there's nothing that isn't, they're basically trying to tell you that everything's just made out of atoms, me and you included. And um, nothing about our universe is something that differs from an object made out of atoms. And that is so much true, according to the argument, that if we had another system which was an atomic copy of the first, then just like a carbon copy of a newspaper image, it's going to be the same in every way. So psychology and thought and consciousness is just something that's within this matrix of facts that are ultimately physical facts based on atoms. Okay, now I told you also though that he wants to defend the truth of physicalism and that he wants to try and give a positive answer to that other question that we mentioned, the truth question. So the truth question asked, is it true that everything is physical? We just tackled the interpretation question. What it means to say that everything is physical is revealed by the notion of supervenience. But now we have this second question to wonder about. Is it true? Is it true that everything's physical now that we know what it means? Okay, he has actually got two arguments to try and uh, make the case that it is true. So I'll talk to you about the both arguments of Stoljar here. Two arguments for the truth of physicalism. So the first one he calls um, the argument from causal closure. And uh, let's all make sure that this is not misspelled. The, the word does not say casual. It's a different word. They're similar in spelling, but the order of the U and the S are different. Okay, so this is the word causal, as in cause and effect. So it is spelled C-A-U-S-A-L. And I just noticed in the past a lot of times students wrote it wrong in their notes, and I get papers and stuff coming back later, casual closure. There's nothing casual about this. Casual is like you're wearing a T-shirt at work on, you know, Friday instead of a button-up, I guess, if you're, you know, that's your attire. But this is about cause and effect, so it's a whole different word and concept. So let's make sure causal, the argument from causal closure. Okay. Now, this argument has got three premises which lead to the conclusion, and as we've seen many times, even last week, in logic and philosophy, arguments are structured that way, where the premises build up and lead to the conclusion. They're the, re they're the evidence or the reasons that are supposed to give you um, a basis to conclude the conclusion. Now, this argument has three premises, which ultimately then lead to the conclusion. So. Starting with the first one, and I'll write it down and try and explain each one. The first premise just says, every event which has a cause has a physical cause. Okay, so first premise, it says... Every event that has a cause has a physical cause. What it's saying is, since we live in a physical world, when things happen, when events happen, and when they have causes, they had to be caused by something else that was physical. So any number of examples could be given, but let's just get this one on the table. Um, suppose that like a tree branch has fallen and hit someone's hood of their car and causes a dent. So that's the event. Now, it's, it's got a cause. It didn't happen for no reason. What would be the reason? Okay, well, physical reasons. Um, passing winds, let's say, and maybe weather uh, gradually weakened the branch. Eventually, it became brittle enough that maybe 
uh, a powerful gust caused it to separate from the remaining part of the tree. Then, because of its mass and uh, the trajectory at which it fell and the wind currents that were then in the environment, it strikes the hood of the car and the force of gravity causing it to fall creates the dent. So it's a physical process all the way down. If you look back to what caused it, you get further physical facts, which themselves were caused by physical facts. I mean, me and you exist. The physical explanation would be the conception sexually by the parent, uh, your parents, right? So um, every event that has a cause has a physical cause or else it wouldn't have happened because if nothing physically caused it to happen, then it just would not have occurred. So that's the first premise. The second premise says, and this one's pretty interesting, it says mental events can cause physical events. <clears throat> okay, so that is the second premise. Mental events can cause physical events. Now what that's really just saying basically is that thought, like by thinking, you can cause your body to do things. Okay, so um, like if I want to, um, right now, I'm going to like um, hold up a peace sign. You know, how did I do that? I mean, I just thought about it and then my hand just did it. Um, if I want to clap right now, there, there it goes. You know, I think about it and then I make the body do it. So that's just the life of being a living organism, right? You have control over the actions of your own body um, just by your own mind, right? So, and that's also exhibited right now. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm, words are coming out of my mouth and sound is coming out of my mouth. And why is that physically happening? Well, the physical sound waves are coming out of this body because I'm trying to deliver a lecture, okay? Um, you know, when I would teach this same lecture, in the classroom, like usual, um, I would like use a student that raises their hand as a teachable moment. So I would say like, what do you guys think about this? Someone raises their hand and I'd be like, excuse me, so why did your hand go up? You know, um, what's the reason? What's the cause? And the student will be like, well, because I wanted to ask a question or because I wanted to answer your question. But that's another fair example. You know, you're thinking, I want to do this. And then you command the body and the body reacts and responds. So <clears throat> that just shows it's a it's a statement that's in a way deep and very um, meaningful, but it's something that I guess is obvious to all of us, right? Mental events, thought, basically thinking, willing, can cause the observable behavior of a person. Um, I like examples, so let me give you one more. Go back to the time of Abraham Lincoln, right? He was tragically uh, assassinated, so he was shot at a, uh, I guess. Playhouse or theater by John Wilkes Booth. So what's the cause of his death? Okay, well, let's take it step by step. The immediate cause of his death, I guess you could say, basically was a gunshot wound, right? So he's dead from a wound from a bullet that struck him. But what caused the bullet to strike him? Okay, let's go back a step. Well, the bullet is caused to hit him in the first place because it was forcefully ejected from the barrel of a firearm. And, uh, okay, but why did that bullet get ejected from the firearm? I guess you could say because pressure was applied to the trigger mechanism of the firearm by a human hand. And that caused the firing mechanism to discharge, releasing the bullet from the barrel and hitting Mr. Lincoln. But if you ask yourself, why did the pressure get applied to the trigger mechanism? I guess you could say, well, because muscles in the hand contracted around the trigger and the nerve signal sent from the brain to the hand is what caused that. But we have one more question. What caused the nerve signal to be sent from the brain to the hand resulting in the hand squeezing the trigger? What caused that? What was the original cause of all this? Why did it happen in the first place? I mean, I gave you a bunch of physical events all the way, but when we get to that last step, what was the first initiating cause led tragically to the death of Lincoln? So you follow my story going back, you know, he's dead from a bullet. Bullets fired from a gun. Gun fires because pressure on the trigger. 
pressure on the trigger because the hand muscles squeezing on it because nerves from the brain are sent to the hand. But why did the nerves get, why did the signal get sent to the hand is the question I'm asking. What caused that to happen? What do you think? You'll see in context that I'm talking about premise two. So, I mean, it's something you should be able to put together here. What do you think? What would be the cause of that happening? Thoughts. Yeah, of John Wilkes Booth. It's because he wanted to kill the president. So it's because he had the thought of doing that that it led to, of course, the tragic result that we have all recorded in history. So that's just one very kind of, I, I like a vivid example, something memorable for you. But it doesn't have to be that. I mean, it could be anything, right? You fall over when you're riding your bike and you hurt your elbow. You hurt your elbow because it strikes, strikes the concrete. It strikes the concrete because balance was lost as you navigated the bike. Um, and that happened because, let's say, mishandling of, you know, the, the, the transport vehicle of the bike by the person. But why did that happen? Maybe it's because of actions taken to even get on the bike at the first place. So through thought, actions can and are produced. That's all that, that as premise two is saying. Okay. So then the third premise, the premise three, it's at a first look kind of confusing, but I'll definitely explain it. So just bear with me. The third premise says this. Um, if an event A causes event B, then in that case, there is no other event C, label it C, which is different from A and which also causes B. Okay, so if, you, if A causes B, and there's no other event C different from A that also causes it. Now, let me just break that down. <clears throat> In a way, it's actually simple. But here we go. What it's saying is that if one thing causes something else, if A causes B, basically then it's the only cause of B. There's nothing else different from A, like C, for example that is like a secondary cause of B. So if A cause B, it's just A and not something else. So maybe simply stated, premise three, can you tell me what it says? It says that for every effect, there's how many causes exactly? That's one way we can understand that claim. For every effect, there's how many causes according to premise three? How many causes for each effect? One, exactly, Sherry. One and only one. Never more than one. Not two, three, four, five, or something else. Of course, not zero. So it's exactly one cause for each effect. Um, so what this is denies, premise three is, uh, he calls it the exclusion principle. Because what it's meaning is that if something's the cause of something else, that excludes anything else from also being the cause. So something that has a cause, it has one cause. Not two or any other higher number. Okay, now, the conclusion of the argument follows from these three premises. My board space limits me from putting it in the proper area, which should be below. So I'm, gonna, going, I'm going to draw an arrow and put the conclusion up here, but in your own written notes, as a logical argument usually is, always is, the conclusion should fall below. So don't copy me to the letter. Write the conclusion, but write it down visually below the third premise. And even a horizontal line which separates the third premise from the conclusion, that would be good. Okay, so here's the conclusion then. Embrace the title of the argument. And let's see what this all leads to. So what this ultimately implies is that, um, therefore, mental events are physical events. Okay, so the conclusion of the argument is that mental events just are physical events. So basically when you're thinking and making your body do something or um, perform some action, 
the thinking part is also just physical. It's just the brain basically doing it. And let me explain how that results from these premises. Okay, so from premise one, every event that has any cause at all has got a physical one. Okay, so every event has at least one physical cause. Premise two indicates that the mind can cause the behavior. But since every event that has a cause has a physical cause, what is the mental event that causes my behavior? It's a physical cause too. It's just a brain process basically. So if every event that has a cause has a physical cause, then when my mind causes events to occur, my mind itself is a physical cause, the brain. We know the brain is involved in the production of your behavior, right? Because brain activity has to occur in order for the behavior to then be exhibited. Then premise three kicks in, which is all important. What premise three is saying is, since we know that your brain is one cause of your physical behavior, it's the only cause of your physical behavior. It's basically saying here that it cannot both be the brain physically, but also separate from that some other mysterious second cause like a soul, a spirit, or as the philosophers call it, a mind. So your brain causes your actions. And according to premise three, that's the only explanation of your actions that we need. It would be superfluous and unnecessary to assume that there are dual causes of your behavior, your brain doing it, but also completely unrelated, a soul or spirit. Since the brain is a cause of your behavior and it's the physical cause of your behavior, no other causes need be involved. That would be to assume more causes than necessary to fully explain the effect. Does that make some sense to you guys? So let's go through the argument one last time. Every event that has a cause has a physical cause. Your behavior is something that has a cause, and we say that it's caused by your mind. But since every cause, every event that has a cause has one that is physical, the mind which causes those things to happen is itself physical. We should just say the brain in that case. The third premise then says and asserts that since the brain is a cause of your behavior, there's no room for a second cause besides that. You know, what sense would it make to say that your brain fires neurons, which causes your muscles to contract in the hand, like in the John Wilkes Booth case. Um, and also, aside from the brain, there was his soul doing it. That would be the sort of, the soul has no job to do anymore because the brain is fully well sufficient to explain the production of the behavior. Okay, so if mental events like thinking and willing and deciding and choosing if those things are just physical events, then physicalism is true because the only thing that anybody thinks is not physical are mental events. So if those are just brain processes and physical states of the brain, then there's no room in this physical universe for anything that is not physical. The brain and its operations and the actions that it produces via the body is just another physical process playing out. So that's one argument for uh, the truth of physicalism from Daniel Stoljar. I told you, though, that he has two of them. This one, I thought, I think, is the better of the two. It's a little more sophisticated in my mind. It's a bit more satisfying intellectually. But he has a second one also, and I'm just going to briefly throw it on the board, uh, and we'll try and understand it too. So one more argument towards the conclusion that physicalism is true. Okay, and now he calls this one the argument from methodological naturalism. <clears throat> okay, so now this argument's, um, I think it's pretty straightforward. It's just got two premises that lead to the conclusion. So the first premise says, it is reasonable to believe what is believed by the methods of natural science. Okay. 
Okay, that's the first premise. It's reasonable to believe what is believed by science, pretty much. Second premise says, physicalism is believed by natural science. So what do you think would be the conclusion here? Let me ask you to do a little elementary deduction. Not too bad. Just these two premises, what what like you know falls from these? What is the result of those? First premise, it's reasonable to believe whatever is believed by the methods of natural science. Okay. Second premise, physicalism is believed by the methods of natural science. And so therefore, thus, hence, so what what's the conclusion to draw? Reasonable to believe what, what is believed by science. Physicalism is believed by science. And so therefore, let me know, what's that conclusion? What is it? Let me know. Therefore, physicalism is real. No, not exactly, Sherry. You gotta, you gotta study and examine these premises a little closer. So, No, neither that, Gilberto. I mean, uh, look at the, pay attention to the wording of both premises. Never does either premise make a statement about things being true or real. But they do talk about it being something else, so what's the conclusion? Just recite it verbally to yourself. I think you'll, you'll by saying it, you'll stumble upon the correct conclusion. It is reasonable to believe that physicalism is true is usually the term people use instead of real, but yes, it's good. So it is reasonable to believe that physicalism is true. I'll just say it is reasonable to believe in physicalism because the term belief implies that you think it's true. That's what belief means. So why is it reasonable to believe physicalism based on this argument? Because the methods of science believe that. Why should that be reasonable? Well, because the methods of science, whatever they believe, is a reasonable thing for you to believe, too. Okay, so like one last look at this argument. What the first premise is saying is simply this, that if you go with what scientists say and you believe the same stuff, you're reasonable, too. Because the scientists who provide these uh, statements are not just like randomly coming up with weird ideas. They have <laughs> empirical evidence to verify their claims, and those things have to be testable explanations. So the scientist doesn't just say, shrug your shoulders, hey, here's what I think, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, it's just a wild guess. Science provides theories that are then tested by means of actual observation. And so even if you didn't like the claims of science, you really cannot say, oh, these people are unreasonable. They just say things that have no good reasonable evidence. The whole practice of science is to accumulate empirical evidence to be able to provide testable explanations for observed phenomena. So um, science essentially relies on having solid evidence because otherwise you can't reach a scientific conclusion. Um, so all that says again is that if you believe what the science believes, then you kind of get to piggyback on the rationality and reasonability of the scientists. So if I say, you know, helium is one of the lightest elements in the periodic table of elements, and I'm just saying, well, I've heard that from science. I'm being reasonable because the people who've established these facts are reasonable in their field, okay? So if you go with science, you can't be called irrational or unreasonable. And then the second premise just sort of, it's like a one-two punch. It just backs that up by saying, and by the way, physicalism is what scientists assume. And they do, right? Because if they thought physicalism was not true, then consciousness would be something utterly mysterious, like a ghost or a soul or a spirit. You can never observe those things, and you can never ever theorize or hypothesize about them or, you know, conduct tests that could be falsifiable involving those concepts. So at least as a working hypothesis, physicalism is presupposed by the methods of natural science. So what do we have here? It's reasonable to believe what science does, and science believes physicalism. So it's reasonable to believe physicalism for you. Why? Because science believes it 
and anything science believes is reasonable for you to believe. But the thing is, although I don't think it's necessarily a bad argument, I mean, it's kind of hard to disagree with either premise. To disagree with premise one, you'd have to say, no, it's, it is unreasonable to follow the scientific consensus. And that's just, I mean, that's like an insane thing, I think, to say. To disagree with the second premise, I mean, that's, that's just a matter of fact. I mean, physicalism is assumed by science. So um, it's a decent argument, but here's the thing. I actually kind of like the previous one that we talked about just before this, the uh, argument from causal closure. And here's my reason, uh, you know, just from my perspective. This argument is basically saying the intellectual labor involved here, that, that should just be outsourced to these smart scientists. You know, just, just follow their lead. You know, you don't have to necessarily know why they think the things they think. But if you just kind of copy them and adopt the same beliefs they have, you'll be reasonable just as much as they are. Um, and it's true that in life we do have to defer to specialists and experts where we don't have the same expertise, right? Like, I'm not going to be the one in my lifetime to, um, you know, understand everything about atomic physics and work over at the particle accelerator in Switzerland. That's, that's something that I think is important work, but I just have to take it um, for, for their word what they're doing, right? Because I don't have the, the technical knowledge to do the same things. When you go to the doctor, right, um, they're the medical expert, not you. So you defer to their expertise and you just trust them and that's what you should do. Um, so obviously we don't all have the time and energy in our lives to take on a full course of study that's going to make us an expert in everything. Therefore, we have to have the intellectual humility to defer to specialists in the areas where they have built their expertise up. Um, but there's a difference between saying, yes, rely on experts and saying just don't ask any questions and just assume that their beliefs are reasonable because they're scientists. I like the other argument a bit better just because it gave you a reason to independently think about why physicalism is reasonable. You know, it says there can't be more than one cause for each effect, right? And your brain is already known as the cause of your observed behavior, so that's probably the only thing that is involved. I like that even if it's more complicated argument because it gives you a reason as an individual to consider that physicalism is true. In this case, the scientists' brains are just kind of like a black box. They're over there with smart ideas. Don't wonder why, just follow their beliefs and you'll be reasonable too. Maybe it's not actually false to do that, but at an intellectual level, I think it's always a little more satisfying when you yourself are the independent person who can come to the conclusion and not just sort of say, smart people said that, and therefore I'm gonna go along. Okay, so we've now covered uh, another author, another essay, we've talked about Daniel Stoljar's paper, Physicalism. Um, I was thinking one last thing, I, I'm going to close the book on this now, but sometimes people disagree with one claim he made in the other argument that uh, for each cause, for each effect, there's only one cause. Some people might say, but hold on, aren't there exceptions to that? Like we talked about the, your birth and your conception, right, by your two parents. You could say, well, aren't there two causes? There's my mom and my dad. But the act of the conception is one event. So you can sort of just sort of uh, condense the causal factors down into that single explanation. Another example I've heard of is the firing squad. Suppose there's one guy sentenced to be executed by a firing squad. So you got like four shooters all pointed their guns right at him and they fire simultaneously. Suppose that each one hits a fatal shot like right in the person's heart. So, you know, what's the cause of his death? Is it shooter A, B, C, D? It seems like it's all four of them. Is that a case where there's more than one cause? Again, he talks about that example uh, for a moment. And he says, in this case, it's not actually like multiple causes. You could just say the firing squad taken as a whole is the cause of the person's death. Or in that case, maybe it's a little overdetermined. So let's just call the firing squad like a single thing. Okay, good. Well, we've fully, I think, covered the Daniel Stoljar, but we have a little more on philosophy of mind. So we're going to continue through this. Next up, it's JJC Smart. Okay, guys, so I'm clearing the board and talk to you guys about the next author. Okay, so today, you know, it's mostly physicalist day. I mean, last week we mostly covered, um, we went into Descartes' argument in a lot of depth, and we, we reviewed that at the beginning of today's lecture also. But um, we're kind of taking stock of the other side of this whole philo philosophical debate in the philosophy of mind. So one physicalist is Daniel Stoljar. We see him, his position, and his argument. Here's another one, okay? So his name is J.J. C. Smart.
J.J.C. Smart. So he lived from 1920 until uh, 2012. Um, he's a really great philosopher of the, the past century mostly, even though I guess he did live into our 21st century a little bit. Um, he's Scottish born and uh, he taught for a lot of time in his life in Australia. Um, it's a funny like small world in philosophy. I actually have an indirect connection to him. Um, I did a I co-edited a book of, like five years ago with another professor um, who's a couple generations older than me. And um, when she was much younger, she worked with JJC Smart in her graduate years. So I mean, doesn't make me more or less knowledgeable about him, but it's kind of nice to know that we all have this, and now you guys have an indirect connection to him too, I guess, right? So six degrees of JJC Smart. Anyway, um, in 1959, he wrote uh, an essay that we're now going to discuss, which is just called Sensations and Brain Processes. Sensations and Brain Processes from JJC Smart from 1959. Okay, <clears throat> so first of all, this word sensation that he uses in this title, he has a particular understanding of that uh, term. So what he means by sensation is just any state of consciousness whatsoever. So let's be clear what that is. I'll put the definition, sensation. Any state of consciousness, any state of consciousness. So it's supposed to cover the entire broad category of different possible ways that you can have states of consciousness. So let me give you some examples of so-called sensations. One sensation is the sensation of watching a live stream lecture on YouTube. That's your current sensation, I guess. Um, another sensation is uh, playing an instrument, riding a bike, um, taking a nice bite of ice cream and feeling the taste of it and experiencing that. Um, having a dream, uh, having a memory, um, having emotional states like hope, fear, sadness, anxiety, um, the feeling of pain, you know, taking an injury and then feeling the physical pain. All of these things are different mental states that a person can have and does have over the course of their life. So we're talking about sensations, but we're mentioning that what it means is just the wide, diverse uh you know, category of mental states that you could ever have, right? Um, now, his claim in this paper, basing off of the notion of what a sensation is, his claim is that sensations just are brain processes. So everything you could ever experience consciously, any mental state that you could ever, ever have, is really just nothing other than a brain process that's going on at that time. So what is the delicious taste of the ice cream? It's like neurons firing in a certain part of your brain, um, which you then experience as that taste. Um, you know, when you get um, a paper cut and now you're feeling a little pain, what is the pain sensation? Again, it's a configuration of your physical brain at that time. Because it's in that state, you have the sensation of the pain. Um, so, okay, okay, sorry, I was looking at the live chat for a minute. I thought I saw a new comment, but not, not to be. All right, so th those, those are sensations, and the claim of the paper is that sensations are just brain processes. So he's obviously a physicalist, because what he's out to show is that nothing about the mind and the conscious states that you have is, is anything aside from the physical. It's just the brain playing its part and doing its thing physically. So the neurons firing, the synapses, etc. that's what experience and sensation is. It's nothing um, soulful or spiritual or disconnected from the physical. It is just a physical process. It's literally just a brain process. So um, he has this, what he calls identity claim, that is sort of like the, uh, the core assertion that he's trying to argue for in the paper. And it's this simple statement, sensations equal brain processes, just almost like a math equation. They're equal. They're the same thing. 
And he really wants to kind of um, spend a moment to make it very clear how how um, how explicitly he means this to be true. He's not saying sensations and brain processes are two different things that are really related to each other. He's saying more than that. He's saying, no, they're literally the same thing. It's like having one object by two different names. Okay? So like me, um, you know, I'm, I'm your professor. Um, I guess I'm also a musician as a fun hobby. But um, those two labels are not referring to two different people. It's just me, one object that I could refer to differently as a, a professor or as a music person. Um, and so in the same sense here, sensations are not something other than brain processes. It's the same thing by a different name. A sensation just is a brain process, nothing over and beyond that. Um, so why is he so interested in making the case that sensations are brain processes to make the case that physicalism is true? Well, he says it's, it's probably um, important to make that case because in his view, it would be really odd if the one and only thing that we cannot explain physically is the mental life of us, our consciousness. Why should he, he says this, why should that be the only thing that we say that's off limits to science? You know, science tries to explain everything scientifically. The goal of the scientist is not just to talk about, you know, volcanoes and photosynthesis and how light propagates through space. It wants to talk about those things, but it doesn't want to just say, but leave human consciousness out of it. That's something we shouldn't be even messing with. Of course, science has the expectation and goal of providing a physical scientific explanation for everything that exists, of course, including us and our consciousness. So if, for example, consciousness was left out of scientific understanding, if it was something that science could not explain, then it would be what he calls, little terminology, a nomological dangler. Okay, so let me give you this term. Okay, so what is a so-called nomological dangler? This is just a fancy sounding word for, I think, an easy concept. It's just something that remains unexplained by science, something that is not understood or explained by science. Okay, so if consciousness was not just brain processes, then it would be something that is mysterious and inexplicable from a physical standpoint. And then it would be what he calls a nomological dangler. In other words, something that science is not capable of understanding or explaining. Question, do you think that scientists out there in the field like the concept of a nomological dangler? Do you think they like that? Like if you're a scientist, do you think that this is what you really hope to get? Things that you can't understand scientifically? Would that be something that a scientist likes or dislikes? The nomological dangler? Yeah, no, they would not like it, exactly. And it's because it would represent a failure of the field of science to understand and explain something. And that's what science is just all about. Science is the business of providing explanations for phenomena so that we understand what causes them, you know? If there's something that science could never formally understand or scientifically explain, then that would represent like a gap in scientific knowledge. It would be like some hole where there ought to be an understanding there. Um, the terminology, nomological dangler, just to make that even more relevant to you, Nomological comes from the Greek word nomos, which means law, um, of or pertaining to law. So a nomological dangler is therefore something that is dangling outside of what we could understand according to physical laws. So if you have like, uh, take a visual metaphor of the body of scientific knowledge as like a self-contained sphere. A nomological dangler would be like some random thing that's outside of that sphere, which we've not yet been able to subsume within our comprehensive scientific understanding of reality. So the scientist doesn't want to give it up and say, hey, 
never mind. Consciousness, that's just, I can't figure it out. It's something that's just baffling. The scientist wants to be able to explain everything uh, according to physical principles. Wouldn't it be weird, says JJC Smart, if physics and science could explain a lot of stuff, but then it has to pull back once we get to consciousness? Why should there be two different sets of natural laws? I mean, it's just one universe, so shouldn't everything in it operate according to similar principles and laws? So he defends this claim that sensations are just brain processes, and if they are, then, then consciousness is not a nomological dangle. If it's just brain processes, then that's part of neuroscience, and it's part of the physics of the neurochemistry that produces your conscious states. And in that case, it's nothing so weird and you know soulful or dualistic. It's it's not an illogical dangling. So he wants to defend that it's brain processes, what your conscious states and sensations are. Um, in order then for him to make the argument defending his thesis here, he next goes over a set of objections that dualists might make against him. Okay, so this is a little tricky, but I want to make sure that I don't lose you here. His next move is to say, all right, I'm a physicalist. Sensations are just brain processes. But there's going to be dualists who are going to attack my argument and who are going to object, right? So he tries to state the objections of the dualist so that he can then show that they're not so good objections. And at the end after he runs through a number of those different dualist objections, he's going to be like, okay, look, I've pretty much debunked them all, and so there's nothing left from the dualist. I've, I've taken their best shot, as it were. You know, I've, I've taken the best objections they could pose to me, and having successfully refuted those, physicalism seems to be the only plausible alternative. Okay? So don't, understand, don't, don't get it confused. These objections are not JJC Smart objecting to himself. It's him stating the objections from dualism so that he can then reply. So there's a set of objections and replies that come next. In the textbook, there's a full set of eight, but I just kind of wanted to jump around and give you all the ones that I thought were the most important for his argument. Because some of them are a little redundant and repetitive. I thought that there were only a few in there that really uh, were important enough to, to focus on for us. So I'm gonna take you on a little tour through some of these dualistic objections to his physicalist stance. And then I'll tell you what his responses are too. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so first objection, objection one, as he numbers them. <clears throat> Okay, so this first objection says <clears throat> that an average everyday person can easily and does easily talk about their sensations. Just in everyday conversation, we, I mean, that's the number one thing we ever talk about, how things were, what we experienced, what we went through, what it was like. So an average person can easily talk about their sensations, but that same average person pretty much has no idea what's going on inside their brain at that time. So if you can easily talk about your sensations, but you can't say anything about your brain processes, how could they be the same thing? If they were the same thing, you'd imagine maybe that a person could talk about both of them equally easily, but they can't. So that's an objection. I'll write it down. Um, an average person can easily talk about their sensations, but cannot talk about and doesn't really even understand uh, their brain processes. So the two must not be the same. So the two things must not be the same. Okay, <clears throat> so there we have an objection to his physicalist position that sensations are just brain processes. So here comes the criticism. No, they're not. They're not the same. Because 
Just talk to anybody and they'll tell you about their sensations. Easy, no problem. But they can't say much of, of anything at all about their brain states. So those must not be the same two things. Okay, now talking about your sensations. If you ask me, you know, how was your weekend? I'll be like, well, it was cool. I mean, I, um, I got in some exercise. I watched that couple installments of that uh, Last Dance Michael Jordan documentary about the Bulls from the 90s. I thought that was pretty entertaining. Um, you know, and uh, I went to bed early on Sunday night. I'm telling you about my experiences, right? I'm telling you what it was like. And that's just one example. Maybe someone, you ask them, how was that meal? You'd be like, oh, I don't know. It was too salty. I, I almost gagged when I was eating it, so I kind of didn't eat too much of it. It was not so fun, to, not too enjoyable. Or another case, you could uh, ask somebody, how was the movie? And they'd be like, Oh, it had me on the edge of my seat. You know, um, the first like 15 minutes or so was pretty slow, but then uh, like later in the film, it went crazy, and I was like really, I was really into it. You know, um, so you know, we talk about our experiences in those everyday conversational way. We explain the events that we go through and what our subjective experience and perception of them was. So that's something everybody does. But here's what a person's not able to do: ask them, "How was the meal?" And they say, oh, yeah, you, know, you want to know how it was? Okay, well, I'll tell you. I started eating it, and then, um, so neural activity over here in my uh, prefrontal lobe became activated, and some ganglion cells over here started to uh, release um, dopamine. Um, and then some neurotransmitters up here in the cortex started to kind of uh, release their own neurotransmitters. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm just employing some of the jargon superficially that they would perhaps use. But the point that I'm making is this. You have no idea what the equivalent state of your brain is when you have a sensation. So what is the brain state equivalent to pleasure? What is the brain process that's equivalent to pain, anxiety, fear? You know, you really don't know, and neither do I. So one could argue then that how could a brain process really be a sensation? A sensation is something we talk about, and that's easy. If you claim it's identical to a brain process, how could it be? Because I've really got no understanding of my brain processes, and I have no ability to discuss them. So, maybe they're not the same thing. There's an objection. But JJC Smart is the person who defends physicalism. So, of course, he's not just going to say, never mind, okay, physicalism's wrong then. One objection, and I guess I'm out. No, instead, he has a rebuttal. He has a reply to the objection. So let's go over that now. Here's his reply. So JJC Smart's reply to this. He says, <clears throat> there can be uh, two different terms or descriptions for something. Um, so two different terms or descriptions can refer to one thing, even if a person is not aware that they refer to the same thing, or even if they don't understand that they refer to the same thing. Okay, so I'll write that down. Two terms or descriptions can refer to the same thing, even if one is not aware of this. So it says, two terms or descriptions can, can jointly refer to the same thing, even if a person does not know that or is not aware of that. And um, there's an example that's given about this. I'm going to erase the objection so I can write a little more about this. So to illustrate this response, this reply, he points us to a very famous example, example given the morning star and the evening star. Morning star and evening star. Okay, now, this morning star, evening star example. This is actually a famous example that is uh, due to the philosopher Gottlob Frege, that was a very good German philosopher from the 19th and uh, early 20th century. Actually, I, I published a paper on it. It was my first published work in philosophy. Um, 
way back, a while back. But anyway, um, he wrote this paper called On Sense and Reference, Zunen Bedeutung in German. And um, he uses this example in there, and it's been repeated by many philosophers since. So, okay. Um, true story, actually. So if you go back in time far enough, at one point in time in the past, you got to imagine before electricity, you know, there would be so much more um, natural light in the night sky, and you wouldn't have all the artificial lighting to kind of block out light pollution, as they call it, right? So uh, in the night sky in centuries past, there was a very, very bright star that was visible in that night sky. And it was so bright, in fact, brighter than all the others, that uh, they gave a name to it, and they called it the evening star. Okay, so brightest star in the evening sky, what is it? Evening star. Now, in the morning time, like early morning around dawn, there will still be some stars visible in the morning sky too, especially because there was not electricity and artificial light back then. So there was also a very, very bright star in the morning sky, and it was the brightest one, and so they coined the term for it, morning star. Okay, so if you're following my little example here, brightest star in the evening, evening star. Brightest star in the morning, morning star. Now, um, as time went on, a discovery was made, and maybe you are intuitive enough to judge what do you think this discovery was that they eventually came to find out? It has to do with the uh, example I just mentioned. What do you think they figured out? They learned that, who knows it? Hmm. Well, <laughs> Gilberto, you seem to have done a little research, uh, but that's something, that's a secondary point. Shauna, you've got it. Okay, good. That it's the same star. Uh, you might have made the intuitive leap because you can see the nature of the response that this is intending to illustrate. But yes, it's the same star. And Gilberto, hold that thought for a moment. Okay, so yeah, when more telescopes that were more powerful eventually came into use, better observations could be conducted. And it was then determined that these are not two different objects. It's the same thing. And Actually, so you want to know his name? I'll just tell you. It's not the most normal. It's a really German name. It's Gottlob Frege. But anyway, they discovered it's the same, same thing. And Gilberto, I don't know how you figured that out or knew that, but yes, in fact, it's not a star at all. It was the planet Venus, which appeared at that time to be a star uh, from a viewing position on the Earth. Um, but at any rate... Um, it's the same thing. That's the point that we're going to take away here. So there were two words though, right? They're two different words and uh, they don't even have the same definition. Definition of evening star, brightest star in the night sky. Definition of morning star, brightest star in the morning sky. And people did think they were not the same object, right? So what does this prove? This proves that you can have two different distinct terms, two different distinct descriptions, but still just one object that they both refer to. Um, that's, that's awesome, Gilberto. So you're very well read on this subject. So you have an easy entry point into the conversation. Um, but look, right, the larger relevance to this is our discussion of sensations and brain processes, you see. So a dualist would say sensations can't be brain processes because I talk about my sensations and I don't know at all what's going on under the hood, as it were, of my skull and my head. I don't know what the brain's doing. But, you know, we can have two different labels or terms and still they can refer to one thing. So sensations and brain processes, they're, just two, they're the same thing by a different name. Um, imagine that I go to like some, I don't know, social event wearing like Hollywood makeup to make me look way different and I introduce myself to someone under a false name, John. I leave, come back, just looking like myself, and I introduce myself to the person as Richard. And then later on they're like, man, and I met two pretty cool people at the party. You know, this guy John was there and I was having a nice chat with him and then he had to leave early. And later on, this other dude, Richard, we were having a cool conversation. Now look, it looks like they're referring to two people, right? Obviously, but it's the same person with two labels attached. So we don't need to necessarily assume that just because the way we talk about our sensations bears no resemblance to the way we would talk about the brain process, that they cannot be the same thing. Uh, as he would argue, 
That's not impossible at all. We see it in the morning and evening star example. Here's another example that he also gives. Take lightning and electricity. So electricity was not always understood by people, but lightning has always been there. So imagine people way back in the day seeing lightning. They wouldn't think, oh, yeah, there's an electrical discharge of ions in the Earth's atmosphere. They would just say big, bright flash of light in the sky. Now, um, does that mean that lightning is not electricity? Because a person can talk about lightning but not know anything about electricity? Clearly not. The scientific or physical description of lightning is accurate, even if it's not something that perhaps everybody comprehends or is familiar with. So why should it be any different from sensations and brain processes? Brain process is the more physical, technical, formal description of what we informally refer to as the sensations that we experience. Uh, but as this author sees it, that's no barrier to them both being the same thing. So let me read, I guess, uh, his point here, as he put it. Okay. Now, I don't know about his language he uses here. I think he's just being a little colorful, a little salty with his language, but, you know, what can I say? I, I didn't write it. So he says this. <clears throat> Here's his statement of the objection first before he moves to the reply. Objection. Any illiterate peasant can talk perfectly well about his sensations or how things look or feel or about his aches and pains, and yet he may know nothing whatsoever about neurophysiology. A man may, like Aristotle, believe that the brain is an organ for cooling the body off without any impairment of his ability to make true statements about his sensations. Therefore, the things we are talking about when we describe our sensations cannot be processes in the brain. Okay, now he gives this reply. Um, one last thing, before I read the reply, I, I want to mention this one other little um, feature of the morning star, evening star thing. He discusses the case of, suppose there were two people that were friends, but they had way different sleep habits. So you got one guy that's the night owl. They never get up early, but they're always up way late. And then you got the other person, the early, early morning person. So the morning guy, he's always up way early and gets to bed way before it even gets dark. And the night guy, he's up all night and he never really sees the day like a vampire. So they strike up an unlikely friendship. I don't know how. But during those rare hours where they're both still awake, they have this conversation. Evening guy is like, hey, morning man, buddy. You know, I know you don't like staying up late. And you're always in bed like before like 7 p.m. and stuff. But I'm telling you, you got to try it one time. Just stay up a little later at least once because you're missing out on some things. I mean, have you ever heard of the evening star? The morning guy's like, evening what? No, I've never heard of that. Describe it for me. He says, okay, well... You know, if you're out late, you'll see it. It's the most beautiful, brightest star in the evening sky. The morning guy's like, like, well, I'll take your word for it, but I'm, that's it's too late for me. But it sounds really nice. But then he says, hey, but my, but buddy, evening man, um, you, you sleep like a vampire all day. You should, you should get up early one of these days because there's things that you're missing out on too. Have you ever heard of the morning star? And uh, evening guy's like, no, I'm, you know, I'm not a morning person. So you're gonna have to tell me what is it says, oh, it's this beautiful, amazing star in the morning sky, the brightest one. So you, have you seen it? He's like, never seen it. Uh, maybe someday I'll get up early enough to see it. So anyway, the conversation's over. It looks like they're discussing how many stars, too. But it's obviously just one thing, whether it's referred to by two different terms in language or not. There's just one object in physical reality. So here's the reply that the author does give. Now I can read. He says, you might as well say that a nation of lazy people who never saw the morning star or knew of its existence or who had never thought of the expression morning star but who used the expression evening star perfectly well could not use the expression to refer to the same entity that we refer to and describe as the morning star. Um, he says another example, consider lightning. Modern physical science tells us that lightning is a certain kind of electrical discharge due to ionization of clouds of water vapor in the atmosphere. This it is now believed is what the true nature of lightning is. No, there are not two things, the flash of lightning and the electrical discharge. There's one thing. A flash of lightning, which is described scientifically as an electrical discharge to the earth from a cloud of ionized water molecules. It's not like a footprint being referenced by a burglar. The lightning is electricity, but the footprint is not identical to the burglar himself. Um, so, at the end, in short, the reply to objection one is that there can be statements of the form A is identical with B, and a person may well know that something is an A without knowing that it is a B. An illiterate peasant, I don't know why he says that, but an illiterate peasant might well be able to talk about his sensations without knowing about his brain processes, 
just as he could talk about lightning, even though he does not know about electricity. So that's his, uh, you know, first set of objection and reply. <clears throat> now, if you feel like you can comprehend that objection and reply, that's good because that's really the core of uh, the substance of his essay. I think that that's the most important objection and response given in the paper. Many of the other ones kind of just recycle the same information and make slight adjustments to it. So I'm going to kind of skip around and talk to you just about a few of the other objections and replies. But that first one there is major, and that's the one that I really wanted you to kind of fully comprehend in the best detail. Next up, though, let's talk about um, the second objection. Okay, so objection two, and it's very similar to number one. It's just this point that um, the words sensation and brain process have different meanings. Um, so they can't be the same thing. Okay, and his reply is it's very similar to the first, just given. It's that um, two words can have different meanings, but still refer to the same thing. Okay. Okay, so just because two words have different meanings linguistically does not necessarily mean that they refer to two separate entities in physical reality. Um, I don't know if I tell you that um, I'm the, uh, the oldest son of Christopher Vulich and that I am um, a philosophy professor at Orange Coast College starting in, or let me say this, I'm your philosophy professor right now, and I'm the oldest son of Christopher Vulich. Those are two different descriptions of me that don't have much similarity to each other. You don't refer at all to what I would later do as a, as a profession when you talk about the order at, uh, of birth in my father's lineage. Um, but those two different terms, of course, regardless of their different meanings, they just refer to one thing, namely me. Same with the whole morning and evening star thing. The evening star definition is about being bright at night. The morning star definition is about being bright in the morning. That's not the same definition, but yet there's only one object that they both refer to. So we shouldn't, according to JJC Smart, be misled by the way that language can create a multiplicity of labels or terms for a single thing. That's not to divide the thing into more than one object no matter how many different invented labels that we do give it. So as he sees it, the sensation and the brain process are the same thing being described in two ways. But what it most essentially is, is the physical process of the brain that, that, we, uh, that we have in our head, okay? So that's the second objection. Hopefully it's making sense. And again, at any point, uh, feel free to just stop me, ask me to slow down, repeat something, you know, if there's anything you wanna go over you can get into more. It's always good for all of us to talk about it. Um, but I'm just going to talk about two more objections in this set. He has eight total, but there was just a few that I kind of wanted to um, really focus on. So these are the first two, and we're going to skip around a little now and go to number four. <clears throat> okay, so here's the fourth objection. Okay, so this is a clever one. It says that um, sensations have no location in space, but the brain process does. So they can't be the same thing. One's located in space and the other is just located nowhere. 
So they can't be the same. That's the fourth objection. So I'll put it this way instead of a de definite article, just plural. Sensations have no location in space. But the brain process does So they cannot be the same thing. Okay, so let's consider this uh, objection for just a moment. Um, right now, let me try and uh, generate a particular sensation for you. How is your memory? Do you have a memory, perhaps, that you can retrieve? of like a childhood birthday party or event. You know, you've had a lot of birthdays by now, so transport yourself back in memory lane to a specific earlier birthday of your life, okay? Got the memory, is it there? Okay, question, where is this memory? Like physically. Um, is it floating around in the room around you in the external environment surrounding you? Is that where the memory is? Can I get a butterfly net out and catch it somehow? Certainly not, okay, obviously. So it doesn't seem to have any physical presence in the outside world. But also, right, well, could I find this memory by just digging through your head and actually like dissecting you? Of course I couldn't do that either. All I would find would be a bunch of blood and tissue and you know, all of that, gore. So the memory is nowhere to be found it seems, but you're having it nonetheless. So one way to look at that is to say that it literally has no physical location because there's nowhere you can point to where the memory is. Um, but where is the brain process at physically? I mean, that's easy. That's where your brain is. It can't be anywhere else. So the brain process occurs within the skull, but the sensation which he's claiming to be identical to it does not seem to have a precise location that you can really point out. Um, in making this example, he talks sometimes about what he calls after images. So let me just give you a piece of information about that. Um, this is a common phenomenon that you experience when you look at a light source for just a little moment of time. If you look at a bright light, not too long because you don't want to hurt your eyes, but like I have a chandelier right here above me. And if I look at it and then I quickly close my eyes, what, what I see is the faint outline of the... Uh, the light source illuminated in my field of vision and kind of like a purple tint. So, you know, if I look at like a circular light bulb for a split second and then shut my eyes, in my darkened field of vision, I'm going to see like the contours of the source of light burn into my retina for just at least a moment. And that's something I'm sure you guys have had happen before, right? If you accidentally caught a glimpse of the sun and then, you know, you have that trail or whatever, that trace in your field of vision that stays there and it remains. It's an after image, okay? I gave you at first the example of a childhood memory because if I was in a classroom, we could all look at the same light, but you know, now we're not. But um, the childhood memory example works fine. Using JJC Smart's chosen example of the after image, I mean, just think about that, right? If you look at a light anywhere in the room nearby you for just a moment, and then you close your eyes, there's the after image. But where is it in space? Like, where's its physical location? Again, it's not floating around outside. It's also not something that I could ever find or locate if I look through your own body. So it seems like it's nowhere, but the brain process, it's right there. Maybe they're not the same then. One's in space, the other seems to be nowhere at all. But, I mean, he has a pretty basic response to this, and it's not too complicated. He just says, look, actually, the sensation is a brain process, and so therefore it's located in space. It's where the brain is. It's no different. So... Okay, so contrary to the way it might seem, the sensations that you experience do have a physical location and it's simply inside of your brain. Why then do we not talk about our sensations as though they have that location? Well, it's because it would not serve any practical purpose of everyday conversation to mention that. 
You know, if somebody said to you, how was the meal? And you're like, that oh, was really good, actually. That's like some of the, that's like the best hamburger I've ever had. It was like perfectly tender. And, you know, I really thought they had an interesting, like special sauce in there that I've never tried before. By the way, the location of that whole experience was up here in my brain, you know? Like, if you said that to someone, they might just be like, whoa, this person's losing it. Because it's not a normal thing to say. It's literally true, I guess, according to physicalism. But there's no practical purpose to ever mentioning that. So in language, we're, we're kind of um, steered in a direction away from mentioning the obvious physical basis of the conscious states that we have, according to physicalism anyway. I should not say obvious, because dualism is definitely a viable position. But... Um, from one way of looking at it, it should be obvious that the sensations are located in the brain, but we don't have to say that because, first of all, it's kind of presupposed and it's a given. Second of all, it would just strike most people hearing it as odd and unnecessary to mention. But according to this author, if you think about it, that's not literally false. You know, the memory that I asked you to just have or whatever, it's up here in your brain physically. Um, but who would ever say that? You know, I'm having a great memory. It's, it's one of the most cherished memories. It's in my head. It's in my skull. It's up there, like, physically, you know, in this part of the brain. That might be true, but it's something that ordinarily we don't have any real pre reason to say. So, once again, he thinks linguistic norms and language and stuff can sometimes blind us to the physical uh, nature of reality, apart from the language that we invent to talk about it. Okay, now, one last objection, and then we'll close the book on this author for now. Um, that's objection seven, so I told you I'm kind of hop-skipping around in the objections to give you the ones that I thought were most interesting. So number seven is this. So you can kind of consider this seventh objection, it's kind of like I would say a Descartes' objection, because it's based on the whole Cartesian idea that you can imagine your mind existing without the body. So the way it's framed here is you can imagine yourself, I can imagine myself having sensations even if I didn't even have a body or brain, you know, because the method of doubt indicates that if your uh, perception was all just formed within this illusion, perhaps, then you might even not have a body right now and you just are tricked into thinking you have it. So it seems, therefore, at least theoretically or hypothetically possible um, to have sensations with no body at all. But if you can imagine yourself having sensations without even having a brain, then that would clearly show that sensations are not brain processes. Because if they were brain processes, you couldn't have them without the brain. You know, no brain process, no brain, no brain process. But if you could have sensations without any brains attached, then that would be a clear proof of the concept that they're not the same. So here's the objection anyway. Um, I can imagine myself having sensations even if I didn't have a body or brain. Okay, see our objection there. I can imagine myself having sensations even without a brain or body at all. I can imagine myself floating around as just a ghost that doesn't even have a body attached to me. And since that's clearly imaginable, then sensations got to be something different from a brain process. Because if they could exist without a brain, then they certainly are not just based on brain processes. But <clears throat> remember, JJC Smart's not just going to take these objections and just give up. He has a reply. And this reply, I thought, was pretty good. He says, okay, to anybody out there who's saying, I can imagine myself having sensations with no body, no brain, that person is basically saying something like this. I think the consciousness comes from like a ghost. You know, it's that, that view is basically saying that consciousness doesn't even have anything really necessarily to do with inhabiting a body, that it could be something that just arises from no physical basis at all, like a ghost. So he has this interesting little move at the end. He says, okay, if you really want to say that consciousness comes from a ghost or whatever, in a way he, he, he says, I can't definitively disprove that. 
Um, but what I can do is just tell you that there are other theories of consciousness that don't have to do with being a ghost. So there's, he says these two at least, the ghost theory of consciousness, preferred by dualists and stuff, and then the brain theory of consciousness, preferred by him and other physicalists. And what he ultimately says in the end is, uh, if these are the two options that you have to think about, brain theory of consciousness versus ghost theory, the brain theory is just so much more plausible and well based on empirical evidence. Um, so he says, this sounds like a ghost theory of consciousness, but the brain theory of consciousness is more plausible and more realistic. So that's the final reply I'm going to talk about here. Um, But the quote unquote brain theory of consciousness is more plausible so that's his response there um, <clears throat> he says I guess there are different theoretical possibilities. Perhaps it's just a ghost that gives consciousness um, and there does not need to be a brain or a body functioning for consciousness to exist. But he says that's kind of not really as plausible as the straightforward brain theory of consciousness. Because in the brain theory, you don't have to have any kind of mysterious connection between like something that has no physical basis and then this body. But on the brain theory, that's easy to understand. The body's part of the, the brain, sorry, is part of the body. So clearly it's integrated with it and that's how it exerts control over it. But if it's a soul doing all this, how's the soul even operating with the body? It's got no physical basis. So how does it interact with it and cause it to do its thing? Furthermore, I mean, when you get certain brain injuries, right? Like a hardcore uh, head injury, which I hope never happens to you, but it could, if it did happen and it has happened to other people, you can have brain damage and it can alter your consciousness. You could, you know, have lost memories. You can have lost cognitive function. Why should your consciousness be affected by physical uh, injuries to the brain if the brain is not the basis of the consciousness itself, right? Um, also, if people take drugs, psychoactive chemicals and things, it alters consciousness, right? But that's because drugs have been administered to the different uh, neurotransmitters uh, of the brain. Why should consciousness be affected by chemical events happening to the physical brain if it's unrelated to the physical brain or if somehow it's independent of it? So these are all different reasons perhaps to consider that the brain theory of consciousness is the more plausible stance. And uh, that's, that's really about it at the end. So in the final parts of his paper, he says, I think I've kind of just turned back the best arguments for dualism. And now you would agree, he hopes, that there's... Um, there's no compelling reasons to be a dualist. The best, he's taken their best shot, and he still thinks they've not really been convincing. So he returns to his major claim. Sensations are just brain processes, and therefore there's no nomological danglers, and everything is just physical. Okay, so uh, we're very close to the end of this discussion of the philosophy of mind. There's just one more author on this that I wanted to at least talk with you guys about for a few moments with the time that we still have. So... Um, Thanks for your patience and sticking with me, guys. I know it's a long night and everything, but, you know, what else are you really doing, right? It's just, it's fun, isn't it? To me, it's fun, so I hope it's fun for you. But back to this, okay? Next author. Try and get a few comments in, uh, and then we'll be done. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> here we go. Alan Turner. Alan Turing it lived from 1912 to 1954, and um, in 1950, he wrote this paper, classic paper in the philosophy journal Mind, um, and it's called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. Okay, so 
I've got to tell you a little bit about the history of Mr. Alan Turing and his biography. Um, so I guess you could say he's not necessarily primarily a philosopher in a way, even though he wrote this paper that's considered very philosophical and fits right into the philosophy of mind tradition. But he's primarily a uh, computer scientist and codebreaker. But calling him a computer scientist is very unique because, in fact, he's like the inventor of the digital computer. You see the dates of his life. He died in 1954 when computers really were in their infancy stages of being developed. But he's the one who gets the credit for being the primary developer of the digital computer, which is a revolutionary device. I mean, we're using computers even right now just to have this interaction. And so we all, I think, owe a huge debt of gratitude to his work. I mean, maybe others would have discovered principles that would have allowed for the technology to develop in a similar way. But as it happens in this actual world, it was Alan Turing. So um, hugely important figure. In a way, I feel like he should be more widely known as a household name because of the great significance of what he did. He kind of became a little bit more widely known in the pop culture, I think, over the last decade. I don't know if any of you guys heard about the movie. There was a movie made about his life that actually Benedict Cumberbatch won the Oscar uh, for his role as Alan Turing. Um, this was the movie called The Imitation Game. They didn't talk too much about his computer science work in that movie because they focused more on something else he did, which was very important. So during his life, you could see it spanned over the World War II era, and he uh, was a code breaker for the Allies, which were fighting against the Nazis in World War II. So he's a British citizen, so Britain and America and other um, allied powers fighting against the Axis powers. Um, we owe him huge debt uh, de of gratitude because not only did he develop the digital computer based somewhat on the uh, code breaking and cryptographs that he was becoming skilled in as a member of the establishment there, um, but because he also helped us to win World War II and liberate you know, the world from Nazi oppression and all of that. So, so he's had a, a very important uh, historical impact. At the same time, though, there's like a there's some weird kind of intrigue uh, about his, the circumstances of his life too, because he was a gay man, and that's at a time, as you know, where that was much more of a taboo and widely condemned by um, you know social norms that existed. In fact, so much so that the fact he was discovered to be gay, charges were pressed against him, and at that time, there were still legal mechanisms that could compel people into court if they were found to be gay. And basically, the court ordered him to undergo a process of chemical castration. So he would have to take this cocktail of drugs, which was supposed to destroy his libido and his sexual drives, um, because they thought that it was, you know, like a deviant thing um, for him to be gay. But anyway, he died of cyanide poisoning when he's only 42 years old. So, you know, some people wonder, could there have been an element of foul play? Officially ruled suicide, but um, nonetheless... We're talking about his work on computing machinery and, and intelligence. Now, this essay of his from 1950, he has an, a unique, uh, well, I don't know if it's unique, but he has an argument in there that's quite interesting, and it's this simple, simple statement. He's arguing that machines, computers in other words, will eventually be having thought and consciousness like us. So his view is that, of course, not when he was still living, because computers had in the 1950s, of course, were uh, very primitive compared to today. You have ones that were like the size of a whole garage, and they had like less computing power than, you know, your your uh, cell phone or whatever, your flip phone even. But um, but anyway, in his visionary um, ability to for project to the future, he saw there's really no reason that uh, as computing machinery becomes more sophisticated, more processing power, more data storage, data speed. We will eventually get there at a certain point in the future, he thinks computers will be conscious beings like us, thinking things, having mental states and everything else. Um, now, let me ask you a philosophical question, okay? What if machines could have consciousness? Do you think that that would be more supportive of physicalism or dualism? If machines that we build out of like wires and chips and stuff, if they could achieve actual consciousness, do you think that that would support physicalism or dualism? Would that show that consciousness is just physical or that, that it's not? Perhaps. You know. What do you think? Would it tend to be more or less, more supportive of which of the two views? If machines were conscious, do you think that would demonstrate physicalism or dualism? Just wonder what you think. 
physicalism, actually. And so that's good, Sherry. Shauna, I guess I can see why you would think that, but let me try and uh, just you know, motivate his thinking on this and the general thinking on this. If machines, uh, and Gilberto, let me see your comment. More physicalism because the machine is made up of atoms. Exactly, good. So machines are, I would argue, uncontroversially physical objects. Nobody looks at a computer and thinks there's a soul in there or there's a ghost in the machine. So if machines could eventually achieve consciousness, it would appear to be a proof of the concept that consciousness can be derived from a purely physical system, uh, something built out of wires, transistors, chips, etc., silica, and all of that, that such a thing could actually produce consciousness would tend to be supportive of the idea that consciousness is just physical. Because we, that would be like a man-made object that is conscious. And um, that would lend support for the idea that our own consciousness is just the byproduct of a very complex physical object, the brain. Okay? So his position is that machines will eventually have consciousness. He doesn't necessarily explicitly mention physicalism, but it's looming large in the intellectual background of what he's saying. Because again, as I'm saying, if machines had thought and consciousness, they're known to be physical objects, and that would serve as a proof of the concept that consciousness can be exhibited in a physical basis. Okay, now, um, he makes the case that machines will eventually be able to think, but he has a particular criteria or test for what they will have to do in order for us to know that they have consciousness. So there's a very uh, well-known example from Turing, which he calls the imitation game, but which in years that have passed, it's been called the Turing test because of him, so it's getting named after him. And Sherry, you're talking about uh, data from Star Trek. Yes, exactly. But there's many other examples like that, you know, um, I don't know, the HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey, right? Uh, R2-D2, um, you know, uh, my science fiction film knowledge is kind of betraying me a little bit right now, but we've all, I think, seen films with that exact kind of narrative that there's a machine in some cases, oh, AI by Steven Spielberg is, I think, one of the good uh, examples of this genre. But yeah, you got the right idea. Machines like that, could they have consciousness? Turing thinks, yes. And since he's the developer and the co creator of the original computer, you know, he speaks with a certain degree of, I guess, insight and authority since, you know, he's like the granddaddy of computing. So anyways, what's the test then, according to Turing, that machines have to pass, as it were, to, to be... Um, defined or considered conscious. So here's the game, the test. <clears throat> and he calls it the imitation game. Um, it's sometimes called the Turing test. So I'll call it the imitation game, but just so you know, others do call it the Turing test. And this is not just a totally hypothetical thing. This game is being played right now uh, in AI labs, in advanced artificial intelligence labs all around the world, which are trying every day to develop more and more powerful um, artificial intelligence systems that can interact with humans in a more realistic way. So when you talk to like Alexa or Siri or whatever, um, and you think you're having like the ability to have a voice assistant, that's just the very tip of the iceberg, right? There's people trying to develop and are developing chatbots that can have very realistic human-like conversations with you. I'll talk to you later, guys, if you want to know about the best state-of-the-art um, chatbots that are winning what's called the Loebner Prize. There's actually an international competition every year to see which robots can get closest to passing Turing's test, um, and they're getting very close. But anyway, here's the game as it's played. Okay, so suppose we have a wall, and on one side of the wall, we have these two individuals. Let's label them just A and B. A is a human being. B is a computer. Now that's me trying to draw a computer. Let's pretend that's a perfect drawing of a computer. Okay. Over here on the other side, there's this individual. And this is just, we're going to call them the interrogator. So here's the way this little game is going to be played. The interrogator has to interview the two subjects on the other side of the wall. And he gets to interview both of them for the same amount of time. So let's say he gets like a five-minute window to ask questions and receive answers.
from A, and then he gets that same five minute window to ask whatever questions that he wants to B. Now, after he's conducted both of the uh, little interviews, he has to make a judgment call. At that point, concluding the interviews, he now has to make a choice. He has to judge which one was the computer and which one was the flesh and blood human being. Now, he is not told in advance who is who. Um, otherwise, there would be no game to play, right? The whole point is, can he tell the difference between the interaction and the conversation with an actual human being? And the same, well, you know, a different conversation, whatever, with, with a machine. Can he correctly identify who is who? He knows one is a robot, and he knows that one is a human, but he doesn't know which one they are. So what counts as a win for the interrogator? If after those interviews are done, in this case, he would win, so to speak, if he says, I believe A is the human and B is the machine. Okay, But he would lose, as it's called, if he got the wrong identification after the interview. So if he said, I think B is the human and A is the computer, then he would have lost the imitation game. Now, Turing said this. When, I mean, in his view, it's not so much if, but when. When we get to a point in future time where an interrogator cannot reliably identify which subject was the human and which was the computer. Whenever we get to that point where he's basically getting the wrong identification about 50% of the time, that's when we should consider computers that are passing tests at that point to be thinking things, conscious beings. Why? Well, because that is the point at which it becomes indistinguishable whether you are having a conversation with a human being or a computer. And since you can't tell the difference, it's you know, one of those things, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it is a duck. If this is a being that you, it's acting like a conscious being, you cannot even tell the difference between it and a human being, then that's where Turing says they've passed this bar, they've surpassed the standards of the Turing test, they're indistinguishable from human beings in terms of how they uh, respond in, in questions and answers. Okay, so do you feel like you can understand that? When, when are computers thinking things, according to Mr. Turing? Uh, whenever in the future we get to a point where you can't tell the difference, basically, about half the time when these games are played between, you know, the, in the imitation game or the Turing test. So a couple follow-up questions about the game. In what method do you think that the – well, I'll start with this, actually. Why do you think there's a wall there? Why do you think they put a wall between the interrogator and A and B? Why can't you just look at him? That should be, I hope, not too bad, not too difficult. What do you think is the reason for the wall in the setup of the of the game? Or the partition? I don't know if it's got to be a wall, but, you know, a partition that you cannot see through. Why do you think that is provided? What's the basis for that? What's the reason for that? Yes, to not just give it away visually, okay? Because if you could just, like, look, then you could probably just tell by appearance. You could be like, well, this is something which I can see – it, it's not a human flesh and blood uh, individual, so I don't even have to worry about the interview. I could just tell by looking. But it's supposed to be based entirely just on the content of the answers given. Because obviously it's not really relevant to the question whether a computer is thinking if it looks like us. You know, I mean, it could look like us. You can make it look like a cat, dog, anything else. Make it look like just a normal, you know, physical computer. Like, But a conscious being is not defined by its outward appearance. So... The wall eliminates that from being part of the judgment. Okay, next question. How do you think that the questions are both sent and the answers received back? In what m format or medium do you think questions get uh, delivered and answers sent back? How do you think the, in the questions, again, I don't know how to say it any more than that, written. Okay, good, Sherry, exactly. Written, uh, probably they can be typed. Why do you think that's important? You gave a good answer, but why? Why do you think they would have to be written or typed? Verbal, no. No, Gilberto, not verbal. That's definitively not the case. Can't be verbal. But Sherry, you seem to get, you had the right answer, so what do you think is the reason for that? Why should they have? You say has to be, so you're confident about what you're saying. Why does it have to be? <clears throat> uh, 
Yes, because otherwise you'd hear the voice, and that could be a giveaway. But it's not supposed to be about tone or timbre of voice, but rather the information content of the answer provided back. So, I mean, if you just asked verbally and you could listen, you might be like, oh, well, that sounds like a little like a monotone. That sounds a little robotic. So that's the machine. By placing them behind the wall and making the answers sent back and forth via text, you're only allowed to consider the nature of the answers themselves and not irrelevant factors like visual appearance or tone of voice. Okay, um, <clears throat> now what kind of questions do you think this interrogator is going to ask to try and make his um, proper identification at the end? What questions do you think you would ask? This is actually something, if, if, um, if we were face to face, I'll have you guys play the Turing test uh, like live in the class because right now there's this one chat bot that's like the prize winner of them all. Her name is Mitsuku. Um, and Mitsuku has won the Loebner Prize for like five years running now. This Loebner Prize is an international event where a bunch of the most sophisticated AI labs uh, get together and try and develop chatbots that will pass the Turing test. As of today, we still haven't quite gotten there yet because you know a skilled interrogator can still make the correct judgment as to whether it's a human or not based on the type of questions, the type of answers. But we're getting closer, and um, Mitsuku is quite almost spooky to talk to. Uh, you can definitely talk to her anytime. There's apps and stuff that allow you access to the computer program and very realistic human-like conversations. But anyways, in a real class meeting, I might have had us play that game where you might do it at your own leisure for fun later. But uh, what kind of questions do you think you would ask in, in case you were the interrogator trying to judge between these two individuals who's the human? What kind of questions do you think that you would ask if we started playing this game right now? And I said, okay, I'm on my phone and I, I'm not going to tell you whether or not I'm giving these questions to a robot or to a human on the other end of my text message. So you would ask if it had a heart that beats. Come on, Sherry. I mean, that's not so hard. The, the computer is just going to say, yes, definitely. Heart's beating strong. <laughs> um, but yeah, I understand why you're saying that, right? Because you're going to try and ask questions that you think would trip up the computer. I think if it was me, I'd go a little deeper, right? Like, tell me what your biggest fear is, or what's your earliest memory, or like, have you ever been in love? What was it like? You know, um, you know. Well, of course the computer can lie. Otherwise, you could just be like, "Are you a computer?" And be like, "Yes." I mean, come on. The, the whole point is they're supposed to be deceptively similar to the human be, uh, behavior. Um, but yeah, so I mean, you'd have to ask questions that would give you some basis to make the judgment. If you thought. Well, that's a little bit of a weird robotic stiff answer about something as deep and meaningful as like tell me your, your biggest hopes and dreams. And the human would give you like a more, you, you might argue, subtle, sophisticated, human-like kind of uh, nuanced reply. But anyway, again, to, for Turing, if and when we get to that point where you can't tell the difference, no matter what questions you're asking, and you keep kind of just, it's like a 50-50 coin flip. Half the time you get it, half the time you don't. So it's just kind of indistinguishable. That's when we should say of computers, they're thinking machines. They, they're conscious like us because when you interact with them, you can't tell the difference. Now, um, there's more on Turing. Just like in every paper we study, there's some objections to him. But for those objections, we were pressed close to the end of today's meeting, so we can't cover them just yet. So we'll definitely finish with Turing's uh, you know, objections and stuff next week. But um, – Next week is, I believe, let's see, the 7th, right? Yeah, so next week's the last lecture meeting, and then the week after that is review session day, and then the week after that is the final. So in, in two weeks from today, you also have that second paper that's due. So make sure, you know, not to maybe wait to the very last minute to work on it, at least maybe identify a topic. And, you know, uh, it's always good, I think, to work in advance of the absolute deadline. I know sometimes it's hard to have a leisure to do that, but that would be advice that helps you, I think, to have a better outcome. Um, next week we're going to have the last lecture, so we're going to finish Turing, and I'm going to try and talk to you guys about as much of the material on life and death as we can. So I want you to read Plato on the Harmony of the Soul. I want you to read uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Existentialism. And then um, we'll just see how much I can talk to you guys about. If I have a chance, I'll try to get to um, the article by either Nagel or Derek Parfit. Um, so... One of those two other authors is probably going to get cut. Uh, I just don't know which one. Maybe Parfit, maybe Nagel. Um, 
So I can maybe offer you guys further guidance on which one to read in the next few days as I consider which one's the better choice for us. But overall, uh, the last few papers are these. Plato, Sartre, Parfit, Nagel. It's too much to cover in one meeting. Maybe I should just choose... Let's just go with uh, not the Parfit, but the Nagel. How about that? So Stripe, Nagel, and I, for next week, all you got to read is Plato, Sartre. Did I say Stripe, Nagel? I meant to say Stripe, Parfit. So let me repeat myself. Plato, Sartre, and Thomas Nagel. That's what's next week's uh, material. And we'll finish this Turing in like 15, 20 minutes at the beginning. Okay, and then we're on to the last part of the class. So anyways, thanks everybody for your help uh, and your patience. I know it's a late night. It's late for me and you guys too. Um, you know, three hours on a you know live live cast it can be a little draining, but um, but I find it stimulating and it's a great conversation to have with you guys. So hopefully you uh, had a good day, have a good weekend. Um, be in touch. Let me know if you need anything. If you're working on your papers, or if you need any feedback or anything at all. And um, until the next time, I guess uh, take care, stay healthy, and I'll see you then. All right. So bye bye, guys. Have a good one.